Next, national anti-drug efforts. Today, a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee met to hear testimony on the state of the nation's drug control policy. Leading off the hearing is former First Lady Nancy Reagan. Other witnesses include Lee Brown, Director of National Drug Control Policy, and former Director William Bennett. This hearing runs about four and a half hours. being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice will come to order. This morning, in order to make maximum use of our distinguished witnesses, the Chair, without objection, will recognize the, the ranking member, the full committee chair, and the full committee ranking member for approximately two minutes after my opening comments. Um, again, recognizing the full schedule before us today, without objection, other members will be allowed five days to insert opening statements into the record. This hearing is to review the President's national drug control strategy and assess where we are in the drug war. Before sharing some key facts with you, I want to welcome our very distinguished witnesses, especially our former First Lady, Nancy Reagan. What brings us together today, those of us who care deeply about this issue, is a concern that transcends party affiliation. What I'm talking about is an increasing sense of heartbreak and frustration. For more than a decade, drug use was falling. We were making progress. We had a policy that worked, and it was rooted in locally created and accountable prevention programs, strong presidential leadership, and a commitment to intercepting or interdicting drug traffickers before they permeated our borders. In the late 1980s, interdiction efforts reduced the inflow of many drugs, and kept their prices high. At the same time, accountable prevention efforts changed attitudes. Kids recognized the enormous risk associated with drug use, and our efforts bore, fr bore fruit. Between 1988 and 1991, monthly cocaine use fell by more than 50%. Between 1991 and 1992, overall drug use fell by 30%. The war was not over, but we were making great progress. Then something happened. We stopped talking about drugs. We thought it either had been licked or that the bureaucracy somehow magically would take care of it. Only it didn't. And it couldn't because we lacked leadership on this subject. But when was the last time that you've heard the president say to a bunch of kids, look, don't take drugs. Don't waste yourself on drugs. Wake up. Drugs will steal your opportunities, crush your dreams and can ruin your life. As I look around this room, I have to ask this question. If we, all of us, our colleagues, and the president don't tell the kids, 
who will. Leadership means actively leading. It means the same thing whether you apply it to members of Congress or the President. For too long, we have all been too quiet. In addition, the administration has consciously made a major policy shift. They shifted the national emphasis from interdiction and prevention from a strategy that was working to treatment programs for the 20% of users who are deemed hardcore. That strategy so far has not worked. Instead, it has set us back. This year, for the third year in a row, the President has reduced the federal monies for interdiction. Assets devoted to stopping drugs from getting into the country by intercepting traffickers in transit zones. As a result, there are more drugs on American streets than there were two years ago, and much less interdiction. So, have we all given up? I certainly hope not. But we are, and here comes the hardest facts, we're facing a new national tragedy. From New Hampshire to Florida, drugs are more available and at lower prices. As the chart over, these charts over here indicate, the growing perception of lower risk among kids correlates with higher drug use. That's 1993 and 1994. Higher perceived risk correlates with lower use. That's the late 1980s. And the other chart indicates that the recent increases in use also parallel, not coincidentally, the President's reduced interdiction efforts. We cannot deny this crisis. In 1993 and 1994, respected annual surveys of 51,000 children revealed use by kids markedly up for every surveyed grade level and for every drug, including crack, cocaine, heroin, stimulants, inhalants, LSD, and marijuana. If that isn't an alarm bell, I don't know what is. In 1994, twice the number of eighth graders were using marijuana than three years earlier. Twice. Between 1993 and 1994, daily use of marijuana by seniors jumped by 50%. Even drug policy experts like Joe Califano, a former Carter Cabinet Secretary, says that we are off the track. Today's casual users are tomorrow's hardcore users. Secretary Califano was unable to be here today, but he wrote me a letter that shares our concern and that at his request I will enter into the record, along with his recent article entitled, quote, It's Drugs, Stupid, unquote. I'd like to pause and read part of Mr. Califano's letter into the record. After expressing support for renewed prevention efforts, Mr. Califano, who now runs the Columbia University Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse, writes, and I quote, Mrs. Reagan has never received due credit for the effectiveness of her Just Say No campaign. It was aimed at the most important target, changing the culture that belittles the danger of drugs and the ability to resist them. More than anyone at the time, Mrs. Reagan helped denormalize drug use in our nation. Her campaign not only discouraged ch children from experimenting with drugs, but gave parents and teachers the support they needed to tell their children and students not to use drugs in unambiguous terms. Unquote. This letter is available at the press table. The bottom line is that we have to step up to the plate, Republicans and Democrats at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. We have to recommit ourselves to a national interdiction strategy that will work and to supporting accountable prevention programs. We don't need more federal bureaucrats and we don't need to have prevention monies appropriated that get spent on things that are not prevention. There is too little money to have to allow it to be mismanaged and mistargeted. But we must help jumpstart this issue. We have to help states, communities, parent groups, and prevention organizations because they are helping us. They are trying to get us back on track. Lastly, I've heard all that I personally care to hear about legalization. We need a different message, and it needs to come from the top. Morally, forcefully, loudly, and often, and there is no other way to turn the situation around. We must refocus the nation on this issue, and we must work together to turn back a real crisis. That is why we are all here today. Thank you. The chair now recognizes my good friend, the ranking minority member, Congresswoman Karen Thurman of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to thank Chairman Zella for calling what we think is a very important hearing today. I join my colleagues in welcoming our first our first guest, former First Lady Nancy Reagan. 
We are all indebted to Mrs. Reagan for her efforts to steer our children away from drugs. I too look forward to hearing Mrs. Reagan's insights about the current state of the drug problem in America. I also look forward to this afternoon's testimony from Dr. Lee Brown, the distinguished director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. A for, as former chief of police for Houston and New York City Police Commissioner, Dr. Brown will bring in a unique and informed perspective to this important executive branch office. Mr. Chairman, recent statistics do indicate a very disturbing trend that drug use is again escalating among our young people. This problem affects each and every one of us in this room. Drugs know no political affiliation. We here in the Congress and the administration have a great responsibility to rise above our particular party ideologies and, find, and help find solutions to these problems. However, I also believe that the drug problem is another example of an issue that the federal gov government cannot solve alone. Parents, teachers, communities, and the media also share the heavy responsibility in sending the message to our kids that drugs are a dead-end street. Mr. Chairman, when you asked for this side of the aisle's input in drafting the oversight priorities for this subcommittee, Democratic members all agreed that this nation's drug policy should be examined through oversight hearings. You and the other Republican members expressed similar concerns. I can say that it is my hope that this and future hearings will be as bipartisan and cooperative in nature. I know that that is your intention. However, Mr. Chairman, I must respectfully disagree with your contention that President Clinton has not demonstrated leadership in the drug war. The facts show that President Clinton has been in the forefront on this issue. He has requested a record $14.6 billion to combat drugs. President Clinton has also elevated the director of the Office of National Control Policy to his cabinet. He has authorized the director to designate an interdiction coordinator and, give, and gave the director more authority to address drug interdiction. And in his message of transmittal of the 1995 National Drug Control Strategy, reiterated his unequivocal opposition to the legalization of any drug that is currently illegal. As many recent polls indicate, it is the public's perception and lack of media coverage that drives attitudes regarding the dangers posed by illegal drugs. Unfortunately, our media is currently filled with stories about celebrity murder trials with stories on the danger instead of stories on dangers of drug use being pushed to the back burner. In fact, Mr. Chairman, I believe it is here in this House where we are failing in our leadership on this important issue. The Appropriations Committee has recently zeroed out all funds for school-based drug prevention programs, including the Drug-Free Schools Program, which started during President Reagan's administration in 1987. Next week, we will be voting on these rescissions. We are about to hear from Mrs. Reagan, who championed the successful Just Say No program, which was targeted towards our students. Over 90 percent of all our school districts in America receive funding from the Drug-Free Schools Program, where Mrs. Reagan's message has had its greatest impact. Is this what we want to say to our communities and our school children, that the Drug-Free Schools Program is not a priority? What does this say about our commitment to helping them fight the ever-present temptation of drugs? Of course, I'm not prepared to say that the current administration has the perfect answer to the drug crisis. This, the past three administrations, both Republicans and Democratic, have grappled with the drug program and problem, with each administration never fully controlling the situation. Issues such as whether it is better to focus resources on the hardcore versus the casual drug user and what interdiction mean method is more effective have been two of the key unresolved and hotly debated matters. This is what this and future hearings need to address, keeping us on a true course to fight and win this vital battle. Finally, the legislative <coughs> and the executive <coughs> branches, our communities, and the media must focus on this real issue, keeping our citizens off drugs, treating current drug users, and reducing the supply of illegal drugs. I trust we all can agree on these principles. In closing, I look forward to the testimony from all of our witnesses today. And again, I want to join the chairman in welcoming the First Lady. 
Um, I would also, Mr. Chairman, ask unanimous consent that the statement of Representative Rangel be included in the hearing record. Yes. Mr. Rangel had wanted to appear before us this morning, but he is not able to be with us because of the recent death of his mother. I just uh, talked to uh, our colleague uh, from New York, Charlie Rangel, and he is uh, vitally committed and interested in this uh, subject. And uh, as we discussed uh, also, you, you indicated his strong support, and we're very sorry that he couldn't be here. But uh, there will be other opportunities as we go forward. Thank you very much Thank for your you. comments. Okay. Um, without objection, that will be part of the record. The chair now would like to recognize the full committee chair, uh, Congressman Bill Klinger from Pennsylvania, for his statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm very pleased to join with you in welcoming the former First Lady uh, to the uh, to the witness uh, table and all of our other distinguished uh, witnesses that we're going to be hearing today. And I certainly want to commend you, Mrs. Reagan, for the uh, ceaseless way that you've dealt with this issue in the past and your continuing commitment uh, to fighting this war on drugs. You've been a real, uh, I think, an example for us all, and we're grateful for that. Your Just Say No campaign, which you spearheaded, and the very strong anti-drug rhetoric that uh, was in President Reagan's uh, administration, President Bush's administration, I think led to a demonstrable decrease in drug use, particularly, as has been stressed here, among first-time young drug users. That was what it was pointed at, and that's where it had its uh, greatest impact. Since then, unfortunately, not much attention has been focused on this issue by either the Congress or by uh, the executive branch. And now, due to that complacency, as we've seen, the studies are indicating uh, that drug use is on the rise. I strongly believe that this Congress should make the war on drugs a national priority once again, uh, return to the, uh, to the high visibility that uh, your campaign gave it. Uh, we need to do all that we can to limit the availability and acceptability of drugs. Fighting drugs is important not only because drugs destroy the user, as uh, we all know, but also because the drug user often destroys other people or property in the process. And the linkage between the uh, drug use and crime has is, is, uh, been demonstrated time and time again. Uh, in the federal prison, which is in my district in uh, upstate Pennsylvania, uh, I talked with the warden who indicated that between 80 and 90 percent of the inmates in that prison, prison are there because of, of drug charges. Uh, so there is a, there is a clear imperative here that we need to be addressing the drug problem if we really ever hope to get a, a handle on the, on the crime problem in the country. Uh, the new Congress, I think, gives us the opportunity to lead on this issue and give the war on drugs the attention it rightfully deserves. And uh, I, I want to again commend you and thank you. You honor us with your presence uh, to be here today, to be our lead-off witness on what I hope will be a res restoration of, uh, of an emphasis on this war. And finally, Mr. Chairman, let me just commend you for the leadership you've shown and the commitment you've shown in, in uh, leading this effort. Uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Curtis Collins of Illinois, for her statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, say that I'm, I'm very happy that you're holding today's hearing on drug policy, and I want to commend you and the ranking member, uh, my colleague Karen Thurman, for her leadership as well on this important issue. I also welcome former First Lady Nancy Reagan for coming here today to testify before us. Mrs. Reagan, I think we all owe you our gratitude for your long-term commitment to addressing the problem of drug use among America's young people. Undeniably, drug use and abuse continue to be major problems in all segments of American society. This is a $49 billion criminal enterprise and its destructive force, uh, which uh, threatens the domestic security of all Americans, regardless of race, gender, economic status, religion, or political affiliation. Drug use and abuse cost this nation 66.9 almost $67 billion in criminal activity, direct and indirect medical mm -hmm. costs and deaths. However, there is some good news. Casual drug use has declined about 50 percent since the mid-80s, and the flow of cocaine into this country has dropped from 540 metric tons to 340. We can continue these gains, I believe, if we recognize that the crusade against <laughs> drug use must involve prevention, treatment, and interdiction. It's particularly in our best fiscal interest to provide treatment. Hardcore users represent only a fifth of the drug-using population, but consume 80 percent of the cocaine sold each year and are responsible for the majority of drug-related criminal activity. In 1993, 70 percent of all drug arrests were for possession. For every dollar we spend on treatment, we could save seven dollars in crime control, emergency room visits, court costs, and long-term medical costs. 
the people who are overwhelmingly and most directly affected by the distribution and use of illegal narcotics are those living, working, and rearing children in our inner cities. <coughs> they are daily witnesses to the brazen displays of midday drug trafficking and gunplay. In my own city of Chicago, the kind of open-air drug markets that are tolerated in low-income neighborhoods would never be allowed to exist on fashionable Lakeshore Drive. Given this reality, I am troubled by recent myopic efforts uh, in this House to turn back the progress we have made to improve social and economic opportunities for, for, for poor and low-income Americans. Through these very opportunities, we have provided concrete and substantive alternatives to drug use. However, since January this year, this Congress has threatened uh, food programs, medical assistance, educational aid, job programs, housing, and energy assistance. In fact, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have supported the repeal of community policing funds, which support community-based efforts to stem drugs and criminal activity, and worse still, have endorsed a repeal of the major source of funding for school-based education and prevention efforts, the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act. Most recently, we have openly promoted the rescission of funding for drug courts to rapidly dispose of cases and make treatment referrals. Now, I am certain if each of us will recall the award-winning commercials by Partnership for a Drug-Free America, which predicted this young man who must take long and circuitous routes uh, home. In his neighborhood and in countless others like it, just saying no is not quite enough. We in Congress have to understand that this and other issues, when they appear, just saying no just doesn't cut it. We must provide the support for that young man and for millions like him who do not want to become enmeshed in the drug culture, and we can help them by assuring that our policy and our funding are consistent with our goal of reducing drug use in America, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Um, I would like to now uh, uh, allow as a courtesy of a very committed, hardworking uh, chairman of our International Relations Committee, uh, a guy that was formerly involved with the uh, Committee on Narcotics, a good friend, our friend from New York, Ben Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, our former First Lady. And I thank you for the opportunity to appear before your committee and join with you in this important effort. I uh, commend the committee for undertaking this very important role. Mrs. Reagan, it's a pleasure to have you join us today. We welcome you back to Washington uh, to be able to discuss these highly critical issues that affect our nation's uh, drug control strategy. Your presence, as well as your powerful just say no message, your involvement in the drug war from the time you took office until the present day have been sorely missed here in Washington. With recent reports indicating the drug and alcohol abuse among our nation's young people being on the rise now more than ever needs your kind of leadership. You and President Reagan were powerful role models and your guidance was instrumental in helping to positively change the attitudes when you start embarked on your campaign, attitudes of our nation regarding the adverse effects of drug abuse. Current administration's policies of overemphasizing treatment of drug abusers, while that's important, was best described by Michigan Governor Engel when he noted that this is the first time that any nation ever won a war by treating the wounded. With this in mind, we welcome you, our First Lady, and look forward to your testimony as well as your continuing leadership on this critical issue. And please send our very best wishes and our prayers. Uh, our, our, you are always in our mind to President Reagan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. I'd like now to introduce a witness who is truly one of a kind. She has worked harder than anyone that we know of to turn back the tide of illegal drug use among children in this country. Her efforts started more than a decade ago, and I believe it can honestly be said that she, through her efforts, woke the nation up to this problem and its pervasiveness in the early 1980s. We are so very privileged to have you here with us today, Mrs. Reagan. Many of us feel very strongly that uh, uh, we know a lot about you. And I believe that there's some things here that uh, we'd like to talk about that we may not know. And uh, this First Lady, more than 10 years ago, made a decision against the advice of many political and well-meaning friends and advisors. She decided that the prevalence of drug use by children across the country cried out for action. She realized that while the topic was not a cheery one, 
she was in a position to do something about it, as probably many of us are. And so she did. Slowly at first, then more vigorously, she began what became a crusade. It was a crusade to educate, to prevent lives from being lost to a menace that preys on children. And it was a crusade that worked. Her interest in the drug issue dated back to her days in Sacramento, when she was the first lady of California. Then, just as now, the painful observation of children in need, adolescents caught in the trap of drug use, pulled at her heart. California's first lady devoted herself to learning more about this issue. That, lady, that learning followed her to the White House. After starting her national crusade, it took the nation about a year to recognize that what she was saying rang true. The nation did have a severe drug problem. That was just the beginning. The First Lady then pressed her case, nurtured the national awareness, and traveled the nation to keep that awareness alive. Month after month, year after year, she visited schools, rehabilitation centers, parent groups, and community organizations. At all times, she kept a national focus on this crusade. In all, she has logged nearly 250,000 miles in her campaign to fight substance abuse. And travel abroad with the president, she would peel off from the president to visit international drug programs and encourage foreign leaders. Unknown to many of you, she actually inspired the interest of many first ladies around the world in starting and pursuing anti-drug efforts. In April of 1985, she brought first ladies from around the world to Washington for the first international drug conference of its kind. In October of 1988, she hosted the second such international conference. In 1988, speaking on this issue, she became the first American First Lady to address the United Nations. Through her efforts, substance abuse awareness among children and adults grew. In fact, to a large extent, she is responsible for having started the snowball rolling. Without her early and exhaustive efforts, I really wonder if we would be here, a bipartisan group, talking about this issue today. In 1981, 85, and 87, the American public in the, American, in the annual Gallup polls for those years voted this First Lady one of the ten most admired women in the world. Every year since 1981, she has been named one of the ten most admired women in the world by Good Housekeeping magazine. And her contributions as a First Lady have been not only recognized, but truly significant. After she left the White House, as former First Lady Nancy Reagan continued her efforts. Her commitment never stopped when she left Washington. She created the Nancy Reagan Foundation to assist her in continuing this crusade, which I might say started with her very important Just Say No campaign and has grown and grown. The Nancy Reagan Foundation has awarded grants in excess of $5 million to drug prevention and education programs, large and small, nationwide. Recently, the Nancy Reagan Foundation joined forces with the Best Foundation for a drug-free tomorrow and has just launched the Nancy Reagan after-school program. This program, already well-received, involves skill building and use of videos to aid drug abuse prevention. I could go on and on. I could tell you more about the individuals she has helped and the dozens of charitable organizations and other involvement she has had and she continues to have. She has won numerous awards for her work against drug abuse, including honors from the United States Chamber of Commerce, United Service Organization, Salvation Army, and many, many others. I would just like to say at this point that it gives me a great deal of honor to introduce a former First Lady and a recognized leader among us all in fighting drug abuse and to educate our nation's children. Thus, without objection and pursuant to an agreement between the Chair and the Ranking Member, the Chair will recognize the Honorable Nancy Reagan and I ask members unanimous consent to withhold questions of the witness. Mrs. Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for your very kind introduction. I have to tell you that I decided to speak today only after a lot of soul searching. As you can imagine, I have very pressing concerns keeping me busy in California right now, and I don't like to be away for long. So I haven't come here lightly. I have come because my heart pulls me here and because my husband and everything he stands for calls for me to be here. I'm not here to criticize or to blame, but after the great strides that were made just a few years back, I am worried 
that this nation is forgetting how endangered our children are by drugs. I'm worried that for the first time in many years, tolerance for drugs and a mistaken perception that everyone is doing it is creeping back into our national mentality. And I'm worried that the psychological momentum we had against drug use has been lost. And yet, it's more than worry. This weakening vigilance against the drug threat has obviously been a disappointment to me, but more importantly, it can have a tragic effect on this country for many years to come. So yes, I am worried about the future of our young people. I am disappointed, and yes, I'm saddened. How could we have forgotten so quickly? Why is it we no longer hear the drumbeat of condemnation against drugs coming from our leaders and our culture? Is it any wonder that drug use has started climbing again, and dramatically so? With my own eyes, I've seen the human destruction drugs can cause. During my eight years as First Lady, as been mentioned, I traveled hundreds of thousands of miles around this country and the world, meeting with young people, listening to the heartbreaking stories of what drugs did to their lives, and that's something as suffering is something I can never forget. When I spoke to gatherings across the country, I often read letters from young people who were facing personal struggles with drug use. I did it for a specific reason. I wanted to educate this country about the toll that drugs were inflicting upon children. I wanted to make sure people couldn't ignore the tragic human consequences of drug use. But I'm afraid we must start reminding people all over again and help them see the benefits of non-use. So let me read to you one of the very first letters that I ever shared in public. And perhaps this letter written by a 16-year-old girl will remind you why it is we're, we're all here today and help motivate others to say no to experimentation or regular drug use. Dear Mrs. Reagan, it's taken many months to finally write you. I really don't know why I became a drug user. I guess because I never really liked myself and now I hate myself even more. Drugs are terrible, and it was a horrible, vicious cycle I lived in. Drugs took me over. I can remember one time when I was high, I needed a fix so bad, I had sex with a man around 55 years or older for $500 worth of drugs. It was worth it at the time. I was once pregnant because, because of the drugs, I had the baby when, I was five, when it was five months early, and it died. The baby's arm was at its leg, and its ear was at its cheek. My parents didn't even know I, I was expecting, nor knew I was on drugs. Drugs ruined my life, and I regret it so much. I long for the day when anyone will say to me, I love you because of who you are, not who you were. Mrs. Reagan, I'm sorry your efforts and care and love weren't there for me three years ago. Please reach my kids my age and younger. Don't let what's happened to me and which destroyed my life happen to them. Her plea was to reach the kids, and that plea still holds its anguish. I am so upset when I think of what's happening to so many children across America. We must give them the motivation and support to say no to drugs. We must correct the perception that everyone is doing it, and we must teach them the skills to recognize and resist pressures to use drugs. Before the drug use increases of 1993 and 1994, we really had seen marked progress. A decade of effort was beginning to pay off, attitudes were being changed, Monthly cocaine use dropped from nearly 3 million users in 1988 to 1.3 million users in 1990. And it's the same story with other numbers. Between 1991 and 1992, overall drug use dropped from 14.5 million users to 11.4 million. I don't mean to sit here and say that we won the battle against drugs. Obviously, we didn't. But even so, the battle was going forward with the help of athletes and entertainers and many CEOs of large companies who put up billboards, sponsored television specials, and funded PSAs. 
there was a momentum, a unity, tolerance, intolerance of the exaggeration and glorification of drug use. In short, there was progress. Now, I think there's been a misunderstanding of the phrase, just say no, and how it got started. So let me, once and for all, tell you how the phrase, just say no, got started. I was visiting a school in Oakland, California, and a little girl, I think, I talked to very young kids, which is what you should do, I think. Um, I think this little girl was in fifth grade, fifth, sixth grade. And she, I talked to her and we'd had questions and she said, she raised her hand, she said, Mrs. Reagan, what do I do when somebody offers me drugs? And I said, well, I just say no. Little did I know <laughs> that this was going to become the this was going to become what it did. Some critics have said that just say no is an oversimplification. Well, of course it is. That's what made it appealing to children and that's what made it effective. Of course it's not the total answer and it was never meant to be. I was just answering a question. But it's important for children to, to appreciate that no is in the vocabulary that no is an acceptable response when presented with drugs. We were building peer support for saying no. Children were beginning to understand that government leaders, actors, musicians, sports figures typically don't use drugs, and they were being taught resistant skills. Where has this social influence model and this support for children gone? Where is the widespread consensus that was backing the children up and giving them the, the motivation and skills they needed. How could we have abandoned that? In the government's latest drug strategy, it says anti-drug messages have lost their potency. Well, that's not my experience. If there's a clear and forceful no-use message coming from strong, outspoken leadership, it is potent. Half-hearted commitment doesn't work. This drift, this complacency is what led me to accept your invitation to be in Washington today. Let me say, I know that many of you on this subcommittee, Republicans and Democrats alike, share my deep concern that we have lost the momentum, we have lost a sense of priority on this problem, we have lost all sense of national urgency and leadership. It's my understanding that current federal efforts concentrate on rehabilitation of hardcore drug users. Now, treating hardcore drug users is naturally part of finding a solution. But treatment can't begin to replace the overwhelming importance of education and prevention. The rea reality is this. Tomorrow's hardcore users are today's children. Roughly 80% of drug users are casual users. Only 20% are hardcore. And most of the casual users are children and adolescents. They are the ones whose lives are changed by prevention and education. Fo focusing so much of our resources on the current hardcore doesn't prevent the future hardcore. As I've said before, we could have a treatment center in every neighborhood and it wouldn't stop the children from experimenting with drugs. And I don't care how many crime bills the Congress passes and the President signs. We could put police on every street corner in this nation and there would still be a drug problem. The real solution is to, drug up, is to, drug, is to dry up the demand. And that can only come through education and strong moral leadership. It can only come through prevention. Now, there are many outstanding prevention programs across the country. Most of them were started and funded privately, and they're doing wonderful work. The Anti-Drug Foundation that I started back in the 80s has now merged with the Best Foundation for a Drug-Free Tomorrow, which has trained over 13,000 teachers and others. And we have a promising after-school program that combines videos with a strong anti-drug message. There are many other committed nonprofit and parent 
groups out there also seeking to save our children. But it all requires leadership here in Washington. And where has it gone? It seems as though this country has lost its drive to keep the drug issue, and especially drug prevention, in the national spotlight. Today, the anti-drug message just seems to be fading away. Children need to hear it, and hear it often, just like they need to hear that they're loved. In closing, let me say that people often ask me what I miss most about our eight years in Washington. In retrospect, I think what I miss most is a sense of common national purpose that so many of us felt as we tried to protect the children. What has happened to our common national purpose on drugs? And how do we get it back? We need to educate this generation and all future generations to just say no to drugs. My chief concern is that the children, the children of America and the world, will say no to drugs, that they will choose life and learn to live in the world that God made, not in the nightmare world of drugs. The children need our help, and please don't deny them that. Thank you all very much for this chance to testify, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much for the honor that you've given us, and the chair thanks you for coming this great distance and in and, and, and the schedule that you're involved with. And most important, the issue that you're talking out. We wish you Godspeed and give our best to President Reagan. Thank you. Thank you. Now do I leave? Yes, sir. <laughs> Next panel would uh, move to the to the table, witness table, please. Um, Dr. Bennett apparently is in a car tied up in traffic, will be with us shortly. So I think uh, it, to conserve time, um, if that makes sense, we'll, we'll uh, swear both of you in and start with your testimony. Would you please stand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I would like to just uh, mention uh, to members that the questioning period will be limited to five minutes per panel and that members will not be allowed to reserve time. 
chair will now recognize the second panel of witnesses. And uh, I believe that uh, we're very, very honored uh, to start out with uh, a, another big veteran of the drug war, a former acting director and deputy director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, now president of the new citizenship project, John Walters. John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've provided the committee with rather uh, lengthy testimony that tries to go through a number of issues because I know um, you wanted to uh, explore a number of areas of drug policy. I won't try to read that, but I'd like to just summarize a couple points. That would be and, great. Uh, for just take a couple of minutes and then, and then uh, turn it over to my colleagues and your questions. I think you have a set of charts that begins with this page. Uh, the first chart is uh, essentially a duplicate of the last you have uh, on the dais. Um, it reflects the details of increased use and the trends uh, between uh, the early part of the 80s and the 90s and the uptick. The second chart there um, goes from a chart that talks about annual use by high school students to um, uh, monthly use, which indicates a heavier degree of experimentation. The reason that's there is you will note that over the last two years of the survey, 92 to 94, not only has the decline reversed, but the increase in this period for 12th graders exceeds the entire decline between 1988 and 1992. So we are accelerating in the wrong direction very rapidly. I agree certainly with, with the message you, many of you echoed and that Mrs. Reagan delivered so eloquently a moment ago. Um, I worked at the Department of Education with Mr. Bennett and worked on drug-free schools before I worked in the Office of Drug Control Policy on, on a variety of things focused at the end on enforcement. Um, we need to have strong prevention. The message has to be reinforced by institutions at work and institutions that do their job. Um, we also agree that uh, uh, you need to have drug, tr drug treatment to handle people who have gotten into trouble and, and uh, are, are uh, in need of some uh, rehabilitation. But if we're going to come to grips with these issues, I think we have to talk about what the institutions are doing concretely and not talk, gen not talk generally as Congress does its work about everybody has to do something. You have to tell specific programs and specific areas of policy what to do. And I think if, as Congress focuses on this to a greater degree, you're going to need to look at and you're going to hear a lot about what works here. The third chart you have is about treatment. In between 1988 and 1993, we roughly tripled the treatment budget uh, of the federal government. During that period, by the current drug office's own uh, uh, numbers, the number of people treated per year declined. I think there are very fine, it's very important to have fine treatment programs, but the problem is the treatment system in this country we have to come to grips with is broken. The bureaucracy is consuming money without producing services. The services provided are not being, not being used effectively. This is detailed in my testimony. But I think we do need more drug treatment. We need more effective drug treatment, and we need to look at the way we spend those dollars if we're going to make a difference here. And I think it's important to remember that in addition to the prevention message at we have to stop the supply of drugs because that not only affects the availability of drugs for young people, but the availability of drugs for hardcore users. The next series of charts in this set talk about who's coming into emergency rooms. Those people are essentially people who have drug abuse problems now. They're not first time users getting into trouble. It's concentrated on, on heavy users. The fourth chart I gave you sh shows the percentages over recent years. Same is true not only for cocaine, but for heroin. The location of these people is lo located in central cities based on emergency room cases. There is a uh, uh, vastly disproportionate representation of black Americans in this population. And what we have is an enormous uh, uh, and, and growing number of sick people coming into our emergency rooms who are the poorest, the least protected, and, um, and uh, people who are subject, being subjected to the increasing availability of heroin and cocaine. Emergency room mentions in 1993, the last year for which data was released, were at the highest level ever recorded since this recording system started in the 70s. Now I'd like to talk for a minute about supply. That I know that's an in interest of the committee. The next couple of charts explain what happened to cocaine supply and availability on the street as a result of a deployment for the first time in large numbers, the U.S. military and efforts to work with Latin American countries in a systematic and tough way during the uh, first part of the uh, Bush administration. The first it, chart eight shows what happened to the cost and the purity. We measure availability in two ways, 
the concentration of, of in case of cocaine, cocaine hydrochloride, and the, and the cost in retail amounts. That increase can be standardized into what was the change in cost for a 100 percent pure a gram of cocaine. Reflected in chart 9 is that number plotted against emergency room mentions. This is like any other product, supply and demand. It's a highly addictive, highly dangerous product. The cheaper it is, the more people use it. The more people use it, the sicker they get. Not surprisingly, when we increase the cost by roughly 30 percent, the stand basis of standardized price, roughly a 28 percent decline in the number of emergency room mentions. That is the only decline during the entire period covered by uh, the system measuring this program in, in the number of emergency room me measures, admissions. Excuse me. Secondly, the drug office also uses a, a model to predict the number of hardcore users. That's on chart eight. This is the only period when the number of addicted users declined. Now that just doesn't work for cocaine. The last three charts I, I have supplied you show you that when you make it more expensive for cocaine, heroin, and marijuana, the number of casualties decline, specifically among heavy users. I'm not against treatment. The issue is treatment will not and cannot be expected to work effectively when we have floods of illegal drugs on our streets. We send people out of treatment facilities back onto the street where you have de facto legalization. Some of your colleagues already spoke about that. Open air drug markets, cheap, plentiful, very little list, risk of, of harm. The mistake I think that the Clinton administration has made so far is to say we need to emphasize treatment and we need to re-de-emphasize interdiction and effective control at the, at the source. We can talk about these issues as you see fit. I, I hope that gives you a summary. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. The uh, former head of the nation's Drug Enforcement Administration under President uh, Clinton and President Bush, a former federal judge and currently at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, Judge Robert Bonner, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for appearing. Mr. Chairman, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I also have submitted a written statement that I'd like to be made part of the record in this matter. And I'd like to just, if I could, Mr. Chairman, very briefly summarize just a few highlights uh, that I think uh, uh, would be well for this committee to keep in mind as it considers the, uh, the issue of uh, drug control strategy. First of all, let me say, Mr. Chairman, I come before the committee deeply troubled, deeply troubled uh, by a number of factors, one, by the data that uh, that does point to an upsurge in drug use uh, in the last two years, particularly among our teenagers, troubled by the, the absence of, uh, of an effective national drug control strategy, and also troubled by an absence of presidential leadership in this area, leadership that I can tell you is so important and so critical to the formulation and implementation of a national drug strategy. I'm troubled because uh, we're witnessing, as has been mentioned here, a rollback over the past two years of hard-fought victories that were achieved uh, between the mid-1980s and into the early 1990s. Progress that, uh, while largely, still largely unacknowledged, was nonetheless substantial. I think uh, the committee should bear in mind, the subcommittee should bear in mind, that the, the goal of national, a national drug control strategy, I think simply put, is first to contain and then to reduce and reduce dramatically the number of regular drug users in our society. And by doing so, we decrease the number of non-productive, dysfunctional citizens amongst us, and we decrease the enormous cost to society in the form of drug-related crime, violence, health, increased health care costs, lost productivity, and the, and, and the like. Using that standard, that tough standard of containment and reduction, progress registered during the the period roughly from the mid-80s uh, into 1992 was pretty extraordinary. Uh, I, I, I know some of this data has been mentioned, but let, it is dramatic. Let me just start with cocaine, and this is according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA data, the household survey. Regular users of cocaine, people that use cocaine once or more a month, in 1985 was 5.8 million Americans. By 1992, that had dropped to 1.3 million. Similarly, crack uh, cocaine use declined sharply when it first became measured by the NADA survey in 1990. At about a half a million in 1990, regular crack users, that had dropped to 300,000 by 1992, just two years later. In fact, in virtually every category of illegal drug use, 
we saw sharp declines between the mid-1980s through 1992. Even marijuana, for example, in 1985, if you use that as a base, a base year, the number of regular users of marijuana was 22 million. By 1992, that had dropped to 8.5 million. These declines were dramatic. Today, I'm afraid after nearly a decade of steady decline in the uh, drug use, and particularly drug use among our high school students, we're now witnessing uh, for, the, for the second year in a row increases in the number of young people using drugs. And this reversal has been both substantial and it has been rapid. The results of the annual University of Michigan survey document the, uh, this, this trend, and it includes basically all drugs, hardcore drugs, as well as the ill-named or so-called recreational drugs. We've seen a 100% increase in the number of eighth graders who've used marijuana in just the last uh, two to three years. And let me say, it's hidden, but I am convinced that heroin use is also dramatically on the rise in America. Uh, and that is a tragedy, and a, a, a burgeoning tragedy of, of, of momentous proportion. So you, I think you can see, Mr. Chairman, why I'm troubled. I think that there, in, in brief, there are just at least uh, three principal reasons uh, why uh, we've come to this point and why drug use has increased so dramatically over the past two years. Uh, one, I think there has been a lack of leadership at the national and, and at the presidential level. There's been a, loud, a lack of a loud, clear, and persistent moral message, the type that uh, Mrs. Reagan was talking about, that illegal drug use is wrong and it's stupid. And we've also had, in addition to that, I think some misallocation of resources that undermines drug law enforcement and prevention efforts in terms of the drug control strategy of the past year or two, one that overemphasizes overemphasizes hardcore user treatment, in my view. And uh, uh, I think that those reasons account for the dismal state of our, our, current, uh, of our current effort. Uh, in that regard, let me say I believe that the Clinton strategy has badly oversold the efficacy of treatment of hardcore drug abusers. Now, I'm not saying it's not necessary, that we shouldn't have funding for it. Of course we should. But when you consider crack cocaine use itself, uh, at, at least according to recent studies and my conversations with Dr. Mark Gold, who is a leading authority on cocaine addiction, when you consider that with respect to crack cocaine users who have received treatment, that less than 10% of these people that have been treated are drug-free after 24 weeks, you know you have a problem successfully and effectively treating a cocaine and crack cocaine. And therefore, it's important that we do something about the pipeline, the vast amount of users or potential users, to prevent them from starting down this road that ends up in hardcore drug use. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Judge Bronner. It's uh, now, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, it's an honor to, uh, to recognize uh, former drug czar, former education secretary, and co-director of Empower America, Dr. William Bennett. And uh, if you would, uh, Please stand. I'd like to swear you in. Sir. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to, to give to this committee uh, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Let the uh, clerk uh, recognize that uh, all answers uh, to the witnesses were in the affirmative. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to begin by uh, recognizing you and saluting you for your leadership uh, on this issue. I'm delighted you uh, had this hearing and brought so many people together, members of different committees, and delighted to follow the First uh, Lady, the former First Lady. Uh, delighted to be here with two of the great uh, anti-drug warriors in America, Bob Bonner and John Walters, and there's another host of them over here. I see a lot of old friends when this was an issue of some prominence in the country. Uh, would that it uh, were so again. Um, I'm delighted you decided to try, at least to try, to make this issue a prominent one uh, in Washington again. When I was drug czar, Mr. Chairman, uh, it was the number one issue in the country. Seventy percent of the American people said it was the number one issue in the country. When we released our national drug control strategy with a president, we always had a president whenever we released the drug control strategy, 
Uh, it uh, led the news on all the networks. We were on all three of the morning shows, 704, 705, whatever it was. There was a lot of attention being paid. Uh, not least among the reasons for the attention being paid was the leadership of at least two presidents on this issue. Uh, Ronald Reagan, you heard from Nancy Reagan earlier, and George Bush. This president right now is virtually invisible on this issue. The most famous statement made by this president on this issue is, I didn't inhale. And the facts of the case in the drug issue today, Mr. Chairman, are that drugs are worse today than when I was drug czar, when I took office. The country was in a fury on this issue, and today the numbers are worse. However, the numbers did go down, as John told you and as Bob told you. The numbers went down, the numbers were going down quite smartly, thanks to efforts of people all over this country, many of them in this room. And I think some efforts at the federal level to draw attention to the issue, and presidential efforts, indeed even at some risk, politically, and perhaps even a personal risk. You may remember President Bush's trip to Colombia. Uh, much criticized by people. People said he shouldn't do it, it's dangerous. But he did it to dramatize the importance that he attached to this issue. Would that we had half of that uh, today. Uh, in the years where the numbers were going down, we had the efforts of parents, educators, clergy, members of Congress, uh, TV and movie people. Uh, we went out to Hollywood, we went to everywhere we could go. The Partnership for Drug-Free America was a very close partner and friend of ours, and they share the same frustration that many of us feel today about the lack of leadership in Washington, particularly and precisely the lack of personal presidential involvement. And so, as a result, because attention has not been paid over the last two years, uh, we see this bad news on the drug front. Drug use among adolescents is on the rise. You've heard from Bob and John about this already. You have heard as well, no doubt know, about the problems of making this uh, an issue of prominence in this administration. Uh, Lee Brown is a very decent man, uh, committed to the right things, uh, but he is not being supported uh, by a White House that seems to care very much uh, about these issues. Uh, days after taking office, the administration cut the Office of National Drug Control Policy staff by more than 80%. Uh, I asked Lee Brown at the time whether he was going to be doing his own filing and his own typing. Uh, soon after assuming office, Attorney General Reno announced she wanted to reduce the mandatory minimums. Uh, the administration has endorsed a drug strategy calling for a cut of more than 600 positions from drug enforcement divisions of the DEA, the FBI, and the INS. It's proposed cutting more than 100 drug prosecution positions in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and it has directed the U.S. military to stop providing radar tracking of cocaine trafficker aircraft to Colombia and Peru. It's not a surprise that things are worse, therefore, on that front as well. And last month, or two months ago, for the first time in our history, the nation's drug control strategy was introduced without the participation of the president. If President Trump, by 1996, this Clinton administration will have presided over the greatest increase in drug use in modern American history. And it will have done so after a period of time when it's empirically demonstrable that we knew some things about getting the numbers down. We knew some things about getting the numbers down and the numbers were going down. It seems to me all things that we're talking about today, and there are a lot of things worth talking about, if you will allow me to suggest that the work of your committee has one major priority, which is to shake up the White House, to get some attention to this issue. Attention must be paid. When we pay attention to this issue, when we talk to the kids, when we get the messages out, things change for the better. When the White House ignores it uh, and uh, the rest of Washington ignores it, things uh, get worse. Just a couple more points and then I'm done. You know, the President uh, spent much of his campaign uh, and the first two years of his presidency decrying in the name of the defenseless poor the social programs of two Republican administrations. And now we're hearing all about the heartless Republicans in terms of budget cuts and so on and so on. These are, all, these are not cuts, of course. They're cuts in the rate of increase uh, of programs. But we're hearing about, uh, uh, we're, we're hearing the Clinton administration take up as tribunes of the poor again. But on, on an issue that disproportionately hurts poor people, that is the plague of poor communities throughout this country, the drug issue, the President and his administration are virtually silent. Uh, where do we go from here? There's a lot to do. 
uh, in my testimony, and John and Bob know more details than I do about what to do and where to go. There's plenty to do. But the main thing is to get that presidential attention. If they won't do it voluntarily, I suggest you just keep talking to them about it until they do. Mr. Chairman, I, I was at a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee about two weeks ago, and I had two Democratic senators come down to me before I went on and said to me, keep the heat on. Keep the heat on this White House. It is scandalous what is going on or what is not going on in regard to this issue. You know, if there were, if there were half the interest in the drug problem that the President has in the baseball strike, uh, <clears throat> we'd be a lot better off. Baseball is actually not within the purview of the federal government, but the security of the citizens is the first responsibility of government. These guys are involved in all sorts of things in which the government has no business. And here, the number one priority of government, the security of citizens, they have punted on this one. So I salute you, Mr. Chairman, and the members who are here. Um, to quote uh, Linda Lohman from A Death of a Salesman, attention, attention must be paid. And attention is not being paid. Uh, I hope you will get uh, these folks to pay some attention. It is a disgrace what this administration has failed to do in regard to the drug war. They are responsible, in part, for those numbers going back up. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. I, I would like to say that uh, I remember you coming up to New Hampshire in 1990, an event that uh, we both uh, were both involved in, and uh, the kids that were there, and that was at the height of the drug war, and the, recept the acceptance and, that you had there and the efforts that you were were outstanding. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate that, that I uh, will start off the questioning. We'll do five minutes per panel, each of us, and then if there's time afterwards, we can continue some more. I'm going to ask one question for my five minutes and let each of the three of you uh, answer it, if that would work. Um, I'd like to just talk about um, the, the detail of, of uh, the military's role in the interdiction process. Um, how can it be better coordinated? Uh, what's needed? Uh, and then maybe all three of you answer that. Um, and, and Judge Bonner, particularly, I'd like you to formulate, if you can, in your answer, something about the kingpin strategy, drug enforcement strategy, which is aimed at destroying the drug kingpin organizations. Uh, it, did that work? Uh, is it something we need to still work on? What, what's happened to it? And uh, John, you've probably got a, a great background. You can jump in on, and maybe all three of you, starting with Dr. Bennett, answer that just general. Well, just in, in general, um, one understands the reluctance of, of some folks in the military to take on this issue um, and, and take up this mission, as, 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 as we say, as often said in the Pentagon. And I remember when I used to go over, Walters and I used to wander over to the Pentagon, I'm sure some of them were tempted to put up a sign, you know, no one's in today, you know, stay away, we're, we're, we're out, out fishing, doing something else. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a great and, and attractive thing to get involved with. But it's, an, it's essential that the military get involved in it. And, and the main involvement of the military is to use their eyes, their ears, and their brains. Uh, when, the, when the Gulf War came, which was obviously a worthy mission, uh, we lost a lot of our folks uh, watching the Caribbean and other places. They can be put back on this job. Uh, first of all, I mean, we can, we can, you can reverse what the Clinton administration did last year, which was uh, directing the U.S. military to stop providing the radar tracking. Uh, U.S. military can do an awful lot of good in this regard without displacing the efforts of other uh, uh, agencies, particularly the law enforcement agencies. Their eyes, their ears, and their brains, they just need to be tasked with this, and that's a matter for congressional and presidential action. Let me comment by saying that uh, I think that we, we, we need an enforcement strategy or a supply-side strategy, if you will, that's capable of, of reducing the supplies of drugs to the United States. And part of that uh, means a strategy that, uh, that uh, can focus uh, the resources of uh, U.S. law enforcement, DEA, and other agencies, as well as agencies or departments like the military on the effort. I will say this, uh, that it seems to me, uh, from my observations, that the, the best way to reduce availability <coughs> of drugs coming, reaching the United States is not by, quote, interdiction alone. We don't define terms too often in Washington, but if interdiction is used in the narrow law enforcement sense of simply locating and seizing drugs, that's not a strategy that alone is going to be successful. In fact, that plays into the strengths, actually, of the major drug trafficking organizations, the cartels, who can easily shift their trade routes and the like. 
Rather, it seems to me that the best way to have a serious impact on supply, or that is to say the availability of drugs in the U.S., is by identifying, targeting the major trafficking organizations with respect to cocaine, that is the Cali cartel and the, those organizations that make up it, which are supplying between 80 and 90 percent of all the cocaine that reaches the United States, and for that matter, any place else in the world. And so the military can play and did play, I think, an important support role in terms of being there to assist in, particularly overseas, assist in identifying and interdicting shipments of cocaine. But we can't lose sight on the focus, and that was the focus of the kingpin strategy, Mr. Chairman, and that was a strategy that was designed to go after the leadership, the key lieutenants, the, not, the means of transport, the means of production of the drug trafficking organizations that are, that are at the top of the pyramid in the production and distribution of drugs reaching the United States like cocaine and heroin. Uh, we can do that. I think we're moving away from that. We're abandoning that strategy to make any, over, any effort, strong enforcement effort overseas, to go after the major trafficking organizations uh, who are, if they could be removed, and I think they can be damaged and ultimately destroyed, who are the source of virtually all of the heroin and cocaine that's coming and entering the United States and ultimately being consumed here. Let me just say two things on, on, on the point. These are federal responsibilities. Parents can't do this. Uh, local governments can't do this. We have to try to go after the central parts of the, of the organizations, as, as Rob said. Uh, what's happened is uh, a long, hard-crafted effort to go after kingpins has been dismantled by the administration in favor of turning federal law enforcement agencies, FBI and DEA, increasingly to helping street-level local enforcement, I think largely for political reasons. And that's a job that should be done by state and locals because they can't do the real federal job. We have organizations that are moving hundreds of millions of dollars a month out of the United States. They are major organizations. There is no plan by federal law enforcement to dismantle them. None. We have arrests. We have individual cases. There's no plan to say if we appropriate their alleged money, how, how much of a disruption do we have? How much of the organizations do we take down? How many of the organizations do we put out of business? That's not even a part of the federal drug strategy today. It's we're going to go after organizations. Well, how, does that make any difference? What's the magnitude? What's the knowledge? What's the focus? The second is interdiction and source country programs. I think you have in your packet this chart, which the Judiciary Committee on the Senate side gave to uh, Mr. Bennett and I when we testified a couple weeks ago. It's from the Command and Control Center in Key West, Florida. It reflects the cuts that the military and other interdiction agencies have received. A 50 percent force reduction in 19, 1994 that's <coughs> caused over a 50 percent reduction in their ability to interdict so, so, uh, uh, drugs as they come into our country through the principal transit zone. The last thing is we worked heavily with source countries in Latin America trying to get them to cooperate and we made an effort to do that both through diplomatic uh, 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 carrots and diplomatic sticks. That has ceased to be a foreign policy issue. We had a major hemispheric summit in Miami. The hemispheric problem for corruption, for destruction of American lives in this country is drugs. That was not a major agenda item, it was a footnote. And the fact of the matter is the administration a week ago certified as a nat with a national interest waiver the government of Colombia where, as the Assistant Secretary of State said in the press conferencing follow that, there was a raid on one of the major traffickers' homes interrupting a child's birthday party. The President of Colombia called the kingpin to apologize for the raid. Now, my argument is it can't get much worse in Colombia if we don't make an example that gives the licit parts of the Colombian government reason to change the policy of the Colombian government. We are letting the world headquarters of cocaine operate with impunity. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, the bells that you just heard uh, signals a, b a vote. We're going to adjourn for 10 minutes. Uh, if that works. We did? Okay, so it'll probably be 15 minutes. Uh, I apologize for this. Unfortunately, this is the way this place works. We'll resume with uh, Mrs. Thurman uh, and her questioning soon. We'll return for more of this hearing, including the testimony of former drug czar William Bennett and the current head of National Drug Control Policy, Lee Brown. But first, here's a look at what's ahead tonight on C-SPAN 2. Coming later, Senators debate an amendment concerning striker replacement workers. Yesterday, President Clinton ordered government agencies not to do business with firms that hire replacement workers. 
Today, Senator Nancy Kassebaum of Kansas introduced an amendment that would reverse that order. Striker replacements later at 1.20 a.m. Eastern, 10.20 p.m. Pacific Time on C-SPAN 2. C-SPAN 2, a public service created by America's cable television companies. Now here's a look at tonight's program schedule. All listed times are Eastern. In a moment, we'll return to the hearing on the nation's drug control policy. After the hearing, see Senate debate on an amendment that would reverse the president's executive order concerning striker replacement workers. Then the South African ambassador to the U.S. talks about changes in his country, followed by testimony on term limits legislation before the House Rules Committee. And that's what's coming up tonight on C-SPAN 2. We now return to the House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee hearing on the nation's drug control policy. Witnesses in this portion include former drug czar William Bennett and the current director of National Drug Control Policy, Lee Brown. So what year are we actually back to right there? We were going to be back to where we were about, what, 87? Uh, Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm glad to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. You bet. Those were the days, huh? Yeah, those were the days. You bet. It's got to be about... Okay. Noting that there is a quorum present, the hearing will resume. I will turn over the opportunity for questioning to our ranking minority, Mrs. Thurman. Mr. Chairman, at this time I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Taylor and then maybe come back to me. Um, Mr. Okay. Taylor has been actively involved in these issues uh, since his time in the Congress, and I think he has some pertinent questions to the testimony that we've just heard. Before you start, I uh, just want to mention Dr. Bennett's got to leave after your questions are over. I'm going to ask the other two witnesses if they would step aside for Dr. Brown to, because he's got some time constraints. And then after he's completed, we'll bring them back if that's okay with everybody. Great. Thank you, Ms. Thurman. And uh, I want to thank the panel for being with us. Mr. Bennett, you said something a little while ago about the administration turning off the radars in Colombia. Are you misinformed or are you intentionally misinforming this panel? Well, I may be misinformed, but I understood that was their intention, sir. No, sir, that, that is not the case. They're very active. As a matter of fact, they're National Guardsmen and they are reservists from all over the country serving at several remote locations in Colombia. I would give you specifics if you'd like later on. Now, we have turned off the radars in Peru, but that is because of the dispute between Peru and Ecuador so that our nation is not seen as providing comfort or taking sides in that conflict. So I want to, I want to clear that up. All right, well that's... I, I, because I really think it's an insult to those kids who are flying the AWACS, the E3s, the P3s, the airmen who fell to his death two years ago Mr. when his C-130 no was shot down. I insult any of those loyal okay. men and well, women. Let's just clarify Absolutely. this. Those kids out there busting Absolutely. their panties every day. Absolutely. But I think you know, too, uh, from the field, uh, if you're talking to folks in the field, there is a sense on the part of a lot of people in the field that this a lot of parts of this war have been abandoned. And, and there certainly are. And that's why I would like to, and I did never had the pleasure of serving with you. And there are some very serious disconnects. For example, the major source of transshipment by drugs, and this is coming straight from Southcom, is not Colombia, but Mexico via land route. It's, in fact, very recently, a 727 full of cocaine landed in Mexico and then transported put the uh, product in trucks and went through the border, the border that was made more open by NAFTA, something both Democratic and Republican presidents have pushed for. So I, I, I kind of take a little resentment when I see a, a, some politicization of this process. So my question is, unlike the Speaker of the House, I served in the military. And I recall the Coast Guard when we had a horrible drug problem. I remember when officers would not go in the barracks at night for fear for their lives. The Coast Guard and all the services started what I think is an excellent policy, and that is of random testing. And then if a person tested positive, they were removed from the service. And it has taken them from having a severe drug problem to almost a drug-free society. I'm curious, when you were drugs are, did you ever contemplate doing the same for federal employees? 
Yes, sir, we did. And uh, we're supportive of such policy. Then I believe, Mr. Walters can uh, recall the record, I'm sure, more accurately than I can, I believe we had some legal challenge to the drug policy, drug testing program. But it was our position that if we were going to be uh, enforcing tough standards, insisting on tough standards, that we ought to teach by example, starting with our office. But as I recall, there was some legal challenge. Story. Yeah, there was an initial legal challenge to Executive Office of the President testing uh, from a complaint in OMB. Our office was created at the beginning of the Bush administration. We promulgated regulations and asked that the regulations for our office be as tough as any federal agency, including DEA and others. We had testing, uh, random testing, pre-employment testing uh, uh, across, across the board. It was in place when we left. Uh, I believe it is also the program that's used in the White House. There is a, still a concern uh, based on court decisions that those, those tests be uh, premised on some security and safety issues um, because there has been an interpretation that uh, you need a, a sufficient ground that blanket testing may be problematic. Let me open this up to the panel. It worked in the military, they're federal employees. <clears throat> Would you support such a move for all federal employees? I mean, we're now talking a large percentage of the American population work for the federal government. I've heard people say, well, let's, let's test for welfare recipients, let's mm -hmm. test for food stamps. If we're going to pick on the guys down here, or test the guys down here, I don't want to say pick on them, don't you think it would be reasonable for a government that is serious about the war on drugs to say, if you want to work for this nation, you're going to abide by the laws of this nation, and you're not going to use drugs. Would, would you agree to that? Sure, absolutely. Sure. absolutely. There ought to be pre-employment testing and where you can justify. I wouldn't want to go too far so that you end up with, with, uh, with a court case that undermines the existing testing levels, but pre-employment testing should be able to be done everywhere, Congress, the judiciary, the executive branch. What, what about um, once they go to and work? Random, and random testing. Well, there, there, are, there are standing court precedent. I mean, you can, you can talk about modifying this if you want, but, uh, and I'm not an attorney. Judge Bonner is, although you know, he may not be practicing in this area. Uh, you do not want to have a rollback. For example, there's a pending case in this, circuit, this term of the Supreme Court uh, for uh, a case of testing at a high school in, in Oregon. Uh, there's a challenge to that right. testing program of varsity athletes. Uh, the people there feel, feel it's important to keep their kids off drugs. There may be a rollback of okay. that program. So if you, you've got to make sure you know what you're doing okay. when you do this. Otherwise, right. the courts, as in many other areas, are going to tie your hands. Mr. Mr. Walters, I'd, please forgive me. But no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, but in, in, no, in this profession, we're only given five minutes to I, say our piece. And, if I would yeah, support okay. that, sir. I would support it. Yeah. Don't I, you find I would it? also be supportive of okay. it, I, but, but I would echo Mr. Walter's comments that there have been court cases that uh, have examined the right of privacy of uh, employees, uh, including federal employees, in terms of the kinds of jobs they hold, whether they are jobs that uh, are potentially dangerous to the public, uh, whether they're jobs involving security. But I agree with the principle, Mr. Taylor, that drug testing has proved effective in deterring drug use. It has in the military. It can in other levels of society, and I think that uh, it's something that uh, that certainly I would support. If if I may, Mr. Chairman, just for an additional minute, you talk to the sheriffs out there, the police chiefs of, of the communities. They tell me 80 to 90 percent of all the crime is drug related, and and I have no reason to doubt them. Again, I, I realize you're talking about the test case, but if the Congress of the United States, which just missed a golden opportunity during the recently passed crime bill, there was very little talk of drugs and nothing done about the drug problem. If the Congress of the United States were to pass a measure saying that as a part of employment for the United States of America, you will subject yourself to random drug testing. And if you're found to be using drugs, the United States of America reserves the right to let you go. And as long as it's done across the board, where everyone is subject to it, and everyone has to live by the same rules. You, you three gentlemen would support that? I would, yes. Yeah, I would just say this one proviso, though, because I think it's important because of the message you sent. It cannot be a statement that pretends to do more than it does, because the drug addicts are not in the Congress of the United States or the federal workforce. The drug addicts are in our communities, and if you're gonna, you, you can't just stop there. You can't diffuse public concern by a gesture like this that, that I think people will become more cynical about it. I'm not saying you're trying to do that, but I am, I am concerned that in this environment, the opportunity for cynicism is extremely high. Mr. Mr. Walters, I'm in total agreement, but I saw what happened in our military. Yep. It worked. Sure. And I also saw what happened when this nation got serious about people drinking and driving. 
and that worked. And I believe this would work. And I hope that your group and others like it will say, you know, we can't tell every business out in America what to do. That's, that's not free enterprise. But we can tell this business, the federal government, and this is the Government Oversight Committee, we can say what the rules will be for working for this government. And, we, and I we, hope, I hope your groups will, would encourage something. When we like were that. in office, we encouraged private sector testing. There's a lot of private sector testing in, out, out there. It, it, that helps, too. I mean, extend it. If you got, you've got to extend the message in a number of ways. And I, don't, I, I wouldn't be too narrow here, but I don't think it hurts to, uh, to uh, use the federal workforce. But um, we can there, set the there tone are a lot for bigger society. fish to fry here. Now, the federal government can lead by example, however. I, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to have to uh, shut, shut it off, but uh, I, I would like to suggest to my colleague and good friend that uh, if you uh, put that bill in, I'd be happy to be a co-sponsor. Okay. Uh, having said that, I would like to also remind all the members that uh, references to the Speaker of the House uh, are inappropriate in my judgment. Um, I'd like to excuse the panel and thank you. Uh, Dr. Bennett, thank you for being here. Other two witnesses will have, call you back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Due to the fact that um, we were called away for a vote and didn't have an opportunity to, to question our um, participants here, uh, is it your intention to leave uh, the record open so that we could submit right. questions? Thank you. All, uh, all questions, uh, we'll leave the record open for five days, submit them for, for response, if that's appropriate. I appreciate that. Thank Good. you. Good. We'll also try very much to vary the opportunity for members to, to now that you and I have had a chance, we'll try to divide that up as well. Okay. Is uh, Dr. Brown? Welcome, Dr. Brown. Before I swear you in, I'd just like to uh, tell you how pleased we are to have you here. We're honored. Uh, you are the current drug czar for, the, for President Clinton. You serve the President with distinction as Chief spokes, Spokesman for the nation's drug control policy. In your past, you've been a recognized and well-known and effective police commissioner for New York, Atlanta, and Houston. You've been involved with law enforcement for over 30 years. Your criminologist and PhD, we're honored to have you here before our committee. Uh, it is our custom to swear in witnesses, if you would, please stand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, not, and only the truth, in your testimony before the subcommittee? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. If you would, uh, if you could summarize, I know you're in a rush as well, and we would like to be able to have some questions so all of your testimony be included in the record. I will, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, or good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. <coughs> Let me begin by saying that I welcome this opportunity to be here today to discuss the President's 1995 National Drug Control Strategy. Let me also commend you f for having Mrs. Reagan as, as your lead-off witness. She's someone that I've admired for years and has made major contributions to our, our efforts to, de to deal with the problem of substance abuse in this country. Uh, she is someone that continues to be an inspiration for many people throughout this country. But Mr. Chairman, before proceeding with my testimony, I want to let you and the subcommittee know that I'm extremely disappointed by the way that you structured this hearing. You have placed me on the third panel to testify following the appointees of the last administration. This is contrary to established precedent in the House for scheduling administration witnesses regardless of which party sits in the White House. Mr. Chairman, I was encouraged by our meeting three days ago when we both agreed that the drug issue <coughs> is not a Republican issue, not a Democratic issue, but an American crisis. But now I'm deeply saddened by the subcommittee's attempt to politicize this issue. This is a gross breach of protocol. But I'm here at this politically orchestrated hearing because as someone who has spent a lifetime in law enforcement, I've seen firsthand what drugs can do to our children, our families, and indeed entire neighborhoods. As a result, I'm determined not to play politics with the future of Americans. That is the reason I'm here. If the Congress chooses to play politics on the drug issue, so be it. 
While we may differ on some aspects of the President's strategy, I think we all can agree that we must work to protect our children from the drug problem, and to do so, we must cooperate in a nonpartisan manner. If any issue should be nonpartisan, it should be the issue of drugs and the byproducts of crime and violence. That said, Mr. Chairman, let me proceed with my statement. As you know, the drug problem in America is a national problem. It affects everyone, not just the poor, not just minorities, not just inner city residents. As a result, working families who play by the rules can only enjoy the fruits of their hard work and the security and bright future they deserve if their communities are free of drugs, free of crime, and free of violence caused by drugs. For that reason, the overarching goal of the strategy is to reduce illicit drug use and its consequences. As can be seen in the chart to my left, the President is requesting a record $14.6 billion in fiscal year 1996 to implement our national drug control strategy. In response to your request, Mr. Chairman, let me briefly outline for you the state of the drug problem in America, how our strategy addresses the problem, and how President Clinton's strategy differs from those of the previous administration. President Clinton views the drug problem not in isolation, but as an extricable link to other domestic policy issues such as individual economic security, health care, housing, jobs, educational opportunities, crime and violence, and family and community stability. Let me refer you to the next chart. Chronic hardcore drug users comprise 20 percent of the drug user population, but consume two-thirds of the drugs sold in the streets of our city. To break the cycle of crime and violence and the consequences of hardcore drug use, we must fund treatment. Past strategies ignore this inextricable part of the drug problem. The best way to reduce the overall demand for drugs and the related crime and violence is to reduce the number of chronic hardcore users. Treatment, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, treatment works. Just last June, a RAN study found that drug treatment is the most cost-effective drug control intervention. In September of 1994, a study of drug treatment in the state of California concluded that for every dollar invested in drug treatment in 1992, taxpayers save seven dollars in crime and health care costs. Today, there are one million drug users in this country who need and can benefit from treatment but cannot get it. The President's budget proposes to close the treatment gap with $2.8 billion for treatment overall. As you can see from the next chart, drug use among adolescents is rising, a trend that started in 1991. We have focused our prevention efforts to deter first-time drug use among our young people. This is and must always be a top priority for our country. We must give communities the resources for a constant message to our youth that drugs are the wrong choice. But just, Mr. Chairman, just last week, the House Appropriations Committee voted to terminate, terminate the entire $482 million appropriated for the Safe and Drug-Free Schools and Communities Program. At this critical time, we cannot afford to end the nation's school-based prevention efforts. Just yesterday, I visited a D.A.R.E. program in a local school, which will be impacted by this rescission. I cannot emphasize enough how important these programs are to deter drug use among our young people so they can grow up with a clear mind and reach their full potential. So, Chairman, you asked me earlier this week what you could do to assist the administration in its drug control efforts. I believe you have an opportunity next week when the anti-children rescission package is taken up on the House floor. I would hope you would fight to restore 
the short-sighted termination of the drug-free schools program. What is being done, what is being proposed, is penny-wise but pound-foolish. The growing availability of cheap and high-purity heroin has caused some concern about the possibility of another heroin epidemic. The Clinton administration is responding to this challenge with a new heroin strategy, which reaffirms that heroin control is one of our major foreign policy objectives. Our strategy continues to redirect international efforts in source countries. Experience shows it is more effective to reduce illicit drug availability by concentrating resources where the drugs are produced. This approach reflects the need to base our interdiction efforts on intelligence-driven operations. Random air, random maritime patrols might have been effective against traditional trafficking patterns, but the current situation dictates a new and a flexible approach. Drug trafficking organizations have shifted their preferred methods of operation to other tactical methods, such as the increased use of container cargo and to other geographical areas. Today, over 70 percent of the cocaine entering our country crosses the border with Mexico. It only makes good sense that we change our interdiction efforts accordingly. The President's budget requests for the Department of Defense in fiscal year 1995 supported the shift from the traditional transit zones to the source countries. Unfortunately, Congress failed to fulfill that budget request. This strategy provides for smarter and tougher enforcement activities in U.S. ports of entry and at our borders. Domestic law enforcement efforts remain central to supply reduction efforts that seek to keep the streets free of illicit drugs and assist in achieving our demand reduction goals. The 1995 strategy presents a new element to respond to America's drug problem, a concise and action-oriented set of action plans for first reducing the demand for illicit drugs, second reducing crime and violence and drug availability, and third enhancing domestic drug program flexibility and efficiency at the level of the community, and fourth, strengthening interdiction and international efforts. Each action plan includes specific targets and steps to achieve these targets. The strategy proposes a new partnership block grant to improve the effectiveness of drug treatment and prevention efforts through grant consolidation and enable the states to respond quickly to prevention and treatment needs. We have removed the mandates in the block grant to ensure that we maintain our efforts to prevent drug abuse. We have a 20 percent set aside for those services. We'll also streamline the application process to create a single form to apply for grants. As can be seen in the next chart, this strategy is a product of your constituents. They want policing, they want prevention, as well as punishment. I suggest in closing, Mr. Chairman, let's do what the American people tell us they want. Let's do what we know will work. Let's do what will make a difference. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared com comments, and I'll be pleased to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And I'm, I'm going to pass on the comments earlier in your testimony relative to the partisanship. Uh, I look forward to working with you. Hopefully we can put this train on, back on the track and uh, get it going. And, and I sure hope so, and, in the interest and, of the American people, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly agree. Um, I would like to uh, now recognize the uh, hardworking vice chair of this committee, uh, my colleague from Maryland, uh, Mr. Yerlich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Brown, I appreciate your comments, and I certainly appreciate the uh, Chairman's comments. If, if there is an issue that we deal with that should not be politicized, it is this one. Uh, with that in mind, let me uh, make an observation or two and, and ask you a question. Uh, Republicans live in the real world, too, and uh, we understand that there are numerous planks to drug strategy, and we can reasonably disagree with respect to how much stress we put on one plank over another. But it seems to me, and, and the former First Lady was here this morning, and I don't know if you had an opportunity to review her remarks or not, but, but her message was, 
and she related the story of how Just Say No began as a simplistic strategy, and she recognized that, and she's always recognized the fact it is simplistic. Nevertheless, many of us, and I'm sure you agree, feel as though, just say no, it's wrong, stop. It's real bad to do this stuff. Those sort of simplistic thoughts are part of any strategy. Now, with that as background, in the 1995 strategy from this administration, uh, in your drug prevention strategy, uh, and I quote, this, your administration declares that simplistic prevention messages of the past appear not to work for today's young people and that anti-drug messages are losing their potency. Now, I understand it's a complicated world out there and, and your point with respect to environment and class and race it all plays a part in, in this. We all know that. But, but why take emphasis away from a simplistic yet strong message that seemed to produce some results five years ago. Let me be quick to point out that I have the utmost respect for Mrs. Reagan and what she's done for the American people in addressing the drug issue in this country. As we look at the drug scene in America, it changes. We've seen a substantial reduction in your non-addicted, if you would, the casual drug user population. But even saying that, we have some 11.4 million Americans that use drugs on a regular basis. By that, I mean at least once a month. Or we have not seen any progress is in the chronic hardcore drug user population. That's the population that consumes most of the drugs, 20 percent of the drug users, but consume up to 80 percent of the drugs sold on our streets. By the same token, they commit much of the crime, uh, cause our health care costs to soar. So that is the reason that the President's strategy is comprehensive dealing with aggressive enforcement, dealing with prevention, education, treatment, as well as interdiction and international programs. We think we have to do all of that. We do not see supply reduction and demand reduction as competing entities. There's so much common ground here. There, there really is. Uh, I hope, though, the message that gets across to you in the administration is that those of us, uh, I think I speak for Republican side and probably Democrat side as well. We'd like to see the President and you and the administration generally use your position as a bully pulpit with respect to messages directed to young people, getting back to, if you will, the morality of this. And I understand that statement and that strategy alone will not work, and Ms. Reagan said that. But, but we really feel strongly about it, and I think the message has, has been delivered, and I hope you all act upon it. Thank you very much. Let, let me just make one point. Let me see that tape. Video tape. The president understands the drug problem probably as, as, as well as anyone I know. Uh, when I interviewed for the position, one of the things that impressed me was the fact that he understood, it, but more than he cared about the problem. Uh, he has produced a videotape going out on the airs to the American children telling them about the, the problems of drug abuse. This is part of the new uh, series of videotapes done by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. It's done a tremendous job in helping America with the issues. And if the committee or the chairman would like, it's only 30 seconds, you might want to see it and see what the president is doing in providing leadership to this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Thurman. Secretary, thank you for being here, and we're real pleased that, that you could testify before this committee. Unfortunately, uh, there were some comments made by the former panel that I'd like to get some clarification on um, that I think are very important. I think the first one is, and I would have asked uh, uh, Mr. Bennett this question, but um, just to emphasize the point, when we talk about adolescent drug use going up and increasing, According to your charts, that actually started in 1991. So it is my understanding that this is not just under the watch of, of yourself and President Clinton. Wait a minute, that's not five minutes. So now I get very, seven. I have very rambunctious staff over here. <laughs> So would you confirm that for me that, that? Absolutely correct. Even let me 
be, be a little more precise in making the point by using documents that are on file in my office. I have before me a document dated May 1st, 1992, from the past administration. I, the, the president wasn't in office then. I was not the director. Let me just read the first paragraph. It says that policymakers in the Office of National Drug Control Policy have concluded that in 1991, both the supply of and demand for cocaine decreased from 1990, precisely the opposite outcome expected by the President's drug control strategy. This comes from the past administration. This is not something we have said. This is true. It's true by the facts from the other administration, true by the facts from this administration. And I appreciate that. Also, I believe in Mr. Bennett's testimony. Um, he had written that last year the Clinton administration directed the U.S. military to stop providing radar tracking of cocaine trafficker aircraft to Colombia and Peru. It's my understanding that uh, the President actually came to Congress to change the law, and it was blocked by the members of the House uh, GOP, and we ended up having to go to the Senate to get it passed. Is that correct? Well, the problem is that the problem occurred in the previous administration. It wasn't taken care of. So we had to deal with it. Very briefly, uh, the previous administration had advised Colombia and Peru that they could not use the informa information we gave them to shoot down airplanes. They announced during this administration that they were going to do that. Our lawyers told us that would put our employees in jeopardy, those who gave the information. So the, there was a temporary halt. President Clinton submitted to the Congress legislation to allow us to do that. The Congress ultimately passed the legislation, and now we are able to, and we have for some time, been able to give the, the on real-time intelligence to Colombia and Peru for the purpose of tracking the uh, aircraft to go across their borders. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, another complaint that was that the Justice Department has no plan for dismantling trafficking or organizations. Do you know if the Attorney General um, disregarded any existing plan on this subject? The fact of the matter is the, the strategy has not changed. When I came in the office, uh, the plan, the strategy was what's called the kingpin strategy, that it continues to be the strategy of DEA and others in the Justice Department. The design is to focus on those criminals at the top of the criminal drug trafficking cartels, arrest them, and thus dismantle the drug trafficking organizations. So that has not changed. Okay, so she was actually just following the actions of her predecessors. We did not change the strategy, yes ma'am. Okay. Um, Mr. Brand, how does the split between supply and demand reduction differ from your predecessors? Let me preface my answer by saying that we do not see supply and demand as competing entities. We need both. Uh, if we have an abundance of drugs on the streets of our city at low cost, we're going to have more drug use. By the same token, if we have, uh, we can't deal with the supply if, unless we curb America's appetite for drugs. If I can have someone put on the, uh, put up for me a, a, a chart, it will sh depict for you what the current split is. Basically, if we look at supply and demand, it's about 39 percent, 39 percent for demand reduction and 61 percent for supply. But as the chart will indicate, domestic law enforcement still consumes the majority of the resources that are being requested by the President in his 1996 National Drug Control Strategy. Unfortunately, that will change. It will change where there will be even a greater emphasis on enforcement because of the rescission package that's now pending before the House, and because of the actions taken by the House in taking away some of the demand reduction funds that were in the Crime Control Act that was passed by the Congress with bipartisan results. All of the, all of the prevention money, for example, would be wiped out with two and a half billion going to build more prisons. The rest, along with the very successful drug courts, being rolled into the funds we had for 100,000 more police officers to implement community policing would go to the states in a block grant with no strings attached. So that will change because of the actions that are being proposed by the House if that continues through the Senate and becomes law. Mr. Brown, very quickly, um, 
since we're going to be taking up the rescission package next week and particularly in light of our testimony from the former first lady could you comment on the argument that the safe and drug free schools programs are duplicative and unnecessary they are not duplicative that's the only federal program we have the fund funds 94 percent of the school districts in this country we have other programs but they're not in our schools that's the program that focuses on our school children, where we have most of our children. To me, it would be a disaster, it would be hypocritical, if we talk about dealing with drug use amongst our young people, to turn around and take away the funds, the only funds that we have, which serves as the cornerstone of this nation's efforts to educate our children about drug use. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now uh, recognize a uh, good congressman from Florida, uh, Congressman Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brown, a uh, couple of uh, questions. First of all, uh, remembering that you're under oath today, uh, how many times did you appear in the first two, year, uh, two years of the Clinton administration or uh, since you're taking office uh, before a full committee of the House? Which full committee are you referring to? Well, the former Government Operations Committee. I have appeared once before the, the, the subcommittee chair by Mr. Conyers. The question was a, a full committee, never. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. The uh, reason being, I, I was some, never uh, asked to I have another question appear. I'd like to ask you under oath, and uh, you can respond now or you can. Uh, I've been on this committee and this subcommittee, well, this committee for 12 years now, mainly under the Reagan and Bush administration. I have never seen a witness approach twice in that manner. It is presumed that the witness is going to answer truthfully. The witness is well aware that he's under oath. You instructed him as such. I find it incredibly insulting to sit here and I, have to listen let to me, this. Let me jump in. I think we've had a, a fraction on both sides of the aisle so far. Let's try to hold back and let's try to keep the decorum of the House. Uh, your point's well taken. Well, again, uh, I just wanted to preface this because I would like his, uh, his response, and he doesn't have to respond before the committee. Uh, you can respond in writing to us. Do you have any uh, knowledge um, uh, or any information that uh, President Aristide or any of his uh, uh, aides or high assistants uh, have been involved in any drug trafficking? No, sir, I do not. Let me ask you a question regarding um, the uh, situation we have right now as, as to use, uh, and if you could answer if there's an increase or decrease in uh, use uh, uh, and statistics relating to uh, abuse of uh, cocaine. Are they up, or, is it up or down? The use of cocaine is level. What about uh, heroin? What we're seeing is something that I saw when is I was it, Is it up or down? Could you, could you respond? What we see is what I saw as, as far back as 1990 when I served as the police commissioner of New York City. What we're about uh, marijuana? Oh, well, I was asking if it, he could uh, answer well, you're, you're uh, if, if it's increasing or decreasing. I was going to answer the question, but you cut me off, Mr. Congressman. Well, okay. uh, you can, if you'd like to ex expand on your response, I welcome when, that in writing because I have a limited amount of time. Uh, and uh, I, I did ask, a and I had 130 members of Congress asking for a hearing on this in the first two years. and was denied the opportunity to ever ask some of these questions. So uh, I welcome your participation in elaborating uh, in writing uh, marijuana use up or down. Marijuana use is particularly amongst our young people. That's going up. And any question okay. we can't get to, I'll be delighted to respond in writing. Now, you also uh, mentioned just a few minutes ago in response to a question from the ranking member of the subcommittee relating to, I believe, the radar policy and also shoot down policy. Was that, uh, what, was that policy, uh, shoot, we had a shoot down and a radar and information sharing policy under the Bush administration and through the Bush administration, is that correct? There was a verbal agreement 
with the two countries during the previous administration. Uh, in this and administration, when the two yes. countries indicated that they were going to use our intelligence to shoot down suspected but uh, the, the actual policy, we were uh, allowing them to use the radar and they, they could shoot down planes before this administration. Is that correct? The policy has not changed. Our policy initially was that they should not use the intelligence that we give them to shoot down planes. Isn't it also true that the individual who was involved in, in making that decision worked in another agency and got a negative response under another administration and then moved into the Department of Justice and uh, 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 forced a, a change in interpretation of that policy, which uh, ended the uh, shoot down and uh, uh, radar and information sharing policy? Not to my knowledge, Peru and Colombia declared that they were going to use the information to force down aircraft suspected of, be of carrying narcotics. When that occurred, it precipitated a concern uh, on the part of the American government that would put in jeopardy our personnel. As a result of that, the President went to the Congress and received legislation that would allow him to make a decision. And the decision is predicated upon if it's in the national interest of that country, and they put into place adequate safeguards to protect innocent aircraft, then we can continue to provide them with intelligence information. And finally, since my time is expiring, do you, do you dispute any of the, the facts or statistics in these charts that you see here? Is there anything distorted or is there anything incorrect? I have not studied the charts, but as you may know, we produce most of the data that you use, and if it's consistent with what my office puts out, then I would have no dispute with what you have. A, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but I do have additional questions and would like to have the uh, privilege of a second round. Thank you. I yield to our colleague from West Virginia, Mr. Wise. Please so everybody has an opportunity. If you want to yield, to, that's fine. Uh, I, if I could pass it, I can come back. I'll be the last one down on the on the train, and I'd, yield them, I'd turn my time over to Mr. Taylor if, okay. if you'll come back to me in proper course. Be fair. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and um, Mr. Brown, wouldn't it be fair in response to the question from Mr. Micah that this administration has looked at providing spare parts for the A-37s to the government of Peru? But let's, let's be realistic about the radar policy, and I have had Mississippi Air Guardsmen there. There have been Utah Air Guardsmen there. There are kids out in the jungle as we speak. But there's some serious flaws in the policy, and that's what I hope, rather than playing politics, that this panel would look at. One of the flaws that I saw, Mr. Brown, when I went to Columbia, and I won't mention the name of the town, but it was way the heck out in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. We've got a radar site there. We fly in on a C-27. There's a DC-9 being loaded <laughs> right a couple hundred feet away from us. And the question is asked, I mean, the Colombians have a plane there that we have a radar site that the Colombians can only fly during the day. They're not, they're not trained at night. And narcos fly at night. But I was told if someone merely files a flight plan, and this isn't a democratic issue, it's been going on for years. If someone merely files a flight plan, they don't even bother them to track them. When you fly into Bogota, Colombia, you fly over what appears to be for minutes, if not, it seems forever, of the most beautiful greenhouses you've ever seen, well-financed, well-capitalized greenhouses. And the question is asked, what do they do in there? Well, they grow flowers. How do they get to the states? They're flown up to Miami. Who inspects those? They're self-inspected. I mean, let's be realistic. There are 10,000 cargo containers a day. 40 cubic foot cargo containers today that come to this country that nobody's even looking into. So while I, I as I said earlier, I commend the E3 pilots, the P3 pilots, the kids flying the AWACS, the guys flying the M16s, the F16s, the guys sitting out right now in the Caribbean. It seems like we're chasing flies with sledgehammers over here and people are driving truckloads in down across the Mexican border. And, and I would hope that your agency now that you're clearly running that agency, would redirect it to try to get us some more customs agents so people can expect to be inspected when they cross the border. I, I think it's a serious flaw. And we do have choke points, and those choke points are things like the container cranes at the ports in our country. 
and, and ships coming in, but, but also trucks coming across the border. I, I wish you would respond to that. I was in California at the U.S.-Mexico border just two weeks ago, along with the, the Customs Commissioner, where we announced a new program called Operation Hardline. We're putting more resources on the border, more equipment, in order to address that problem. Uh, a week from now, I'll be back at the border to see how we can use more technology that we have in the federal government to help address the problem. I am deeply concerned about the problem. As I said, up to 80, 70, 80 percent of the drugs that come into this country come through Mexico. So we have to work with the Mexican government in order to address the problem. I'm committed to make sure that we do all that's humanly possible to address the problem. There also becomes a responsibility for the Mexican government to do what they can in country, the Colombian government to do what they can in their country. So I believe that working together, we, we must make a difference. We can't continue the way we're going right now. And, and isn't it also accurate to say, in response again to Mr. Micah's line of questioning, that there is serious concern from a military standpoint, from a State Department standpoint, that in actually some of these Latin South and Central American countries, there is actually an institutionalized drug business where the narco traffickers have actually bought representation in their parliament or their Congress, where in some instances we suspect that people were elected presidents of some of these countries with narco trafficker funds, and that it's kind of silly to count on a guy who's been elected president with narco trafficker funds to, to say, well, he's going to shoot them down. Wouldn't it make more sense to try to solve the problem where we can within our own borders, using the military where we can to catch the obvious and flagrant uses of, of private aircraft? But don't, I'm, I'm asking, don't you think it would make more sense to, to have more inspections here in this country? We cannot control the, the destiny of, of every country in the world. We should be able to control our own destiny. Our position is to do both to work with the source countries and the transit countries and try to assist the, them by improving their institutions, their law enforcement, their court system to deal with the problem in the country. At the same time, we have to also control our borders. We have to beef up more resources on our borders in order to keep the drugs from coming in. So the policy we have, as dictated by the President in a presidential decision directive, is that we will place more resources in the source countries assisting them in addressing the problem there. The logic is if we can stop the drugs at the source, we're better off than when they leave and go through the vast airspace, land space, and sea space that come, that, that come into our country. But that means also that we have to make sure that we have the resources on our borders to stop them there. So we have to do both. Ms. Brown, I'm not, again, arguing with your sure. effort or your intent. Just last weekend in Columbia, <coughs> the guerrillas went in, seized the mayor, his entire city council, took off to the woods with them. Again, how realistic is it to expect a nation that cannot control its internal destiny to spend that much time and that much effort when we seriously question who controls their parliament, who controls their presidency, wouldn't it, and I'm being serious, I, I'm, I'm, we're in the same political party, I'm not sure. here to beat up on you, but I'm asking you to rethink the strategy, because I don't think the, uh, the idea of counting on the Colombians to solve the drug problem, when we know that island that is owned by Colombia, just north of Colombia, is a major transshipment point, wouldn't it be more realistic to try to focus inside this country? Now, I agree with you 100 percent that the drug trafficking business corrupts officials. In Colombia, as well as any other place in the world where you have that magnitude of money going through the drug trade, the drug industry, uh, it's important for us to work with Colombia. If that's the country where we have the drug cartels, the drug gangsters operating out of, it's important for us to work with them because this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a global problem. Other countries are working in Colombia. We've seen some success, uh, clearly not enough. Uh, we've seen some success in the capture and ultimate killing of Pablo Escobar and thus the dismantling of the uh, Medellin cartel. It's our hope that the Colombian government will put all the effort and resources 
that they have at their disposal to do the same thing with the county cartel. That is the reason when the President made his recommendations to Congress on certification of drug trafficking in producing countries, that Colombia was not certified, but given a national interest waiver with the expectation that the message that we have for them is that you have to do more in your country to receive a certification from the United States government. So I see no differences in our opinion on this issue. There's some serious problems in Colombia recognized by the fact that they did not receive certification by the President this year. But the same token, we have worked with them and we must continue to work with them in order to help address the problem in the, in the country. The gentleman's time has expired, but I'll recognize him for one brief. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brown, was there any, since the legitimate trade of things like flowers from Colombia is a source of income to hopefully some legitimate people? That is correct. Was a part of the negotiations, I mean, what sort of threats were used by the President to say, if you don't straighten up your act, we will see, you can't send your goods here? Was well, that even brought into the equation? I'm not aware of that being part of the negotiations by the State Department. What they look at in terms of the law on certification is whether or not the country did a substantial amount to bring about improvements in their country or whether they cooperated with the United States government in addressing the drug issue. Now, other aspects such as the, the flower industry would be handled, handled outside of that certification process. I hear your comments, and I will be delighted to sit down with you, pursue this in more detail, and work with you on it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, it's my pleasure to recognize a fellow freshman member from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Hi. <clears throat> I have, um, I want to make a, a couple of general comments uh, first before I get to a very particular question. Uh, I uh, respect your efforts in Houston and New York, and any comments that we've made today are not directed at you. It would be very difficult to defend yeah, the President, no. and I would not want to be in your position. I uh, right. I, you may not agree with that point, but you're not the target of a lot of the questions, and I hope you realize that there is uh, some of that uh, difference. I am concerned about your comments regarding partisanship. I have a quote here, I have been in Congress for over two decades and I have never, never, never found any administration that has been so silent on this great challenge to the American people. Mr. Rangel is not being partisan when he says that. I also uh, was very disturbed by your uh, comment, I, I'm sorry I missed the first part of your, your testimony, but in your testimony you took a direct shot and a very political shot. I am outraged that we're going to fund a tax break for the wealthiest Americans by gutting drug education in our schools, which is a very partisan statement. And I understand we're going to try to, to calm down with that, but uh, partisanship goes both directions. And when we have strong feelings on this, it does become partisan. You said, uh, and this is my uh, question, you specifically have uh, made statements about the rescission on drug education as somebody who worked in helping draft some of those bills uh, when I was with Senator Coates, I have grave concerns about how the money's been spent. A Michigan study says it has been misapplied, untargeted, and unaudited. And did you take that into consideration when you were uh, uh, saying that this was uh, uh, something that we shouldn't be looking at? We favor block granting, giving more flexibility, and actually getting the money into the drug war. This kind of stuff has often had nothing to do with really battling drugs and has more been touchy-feely programs that have not been effective. As you, as you adequately pointed out, I spent a career in law enforcement. I started off in 1960 walking the beat. One of my first assignments was an undercover narcotics officer. Since that time, I've served as a sheriff and dealt with suburban as well as rural law enforcement issues. And I've also headed large police departments, uh, Atlanta, Houston, and the largest in America, which is New York City. I've seen the drug problem firsthand. I know what goes on on the streets of our city, whether it is in urban America or rural America. And as a result of that, I am outraged, uh, Mr. Congressman, that we would say on the one hand that we want to deal with the problem of substance abuse amongst our young people as indicated by the charts that you display behind you. But at the same time, the one program that we have in this country to deal with the drug problem, our Safe and Drug-Free Schools program, you would take back all of the money, not a percentage, but 100 percent of the $482 million of the funds that serve as a, the cornerstone 
of our efforts to keep our young people from using drugs in this country. It is outrageous, and I stick by that statement. Do you have any evidence that it has had any impact? I mean, in your, your testimony, you say that, uh, first off, you said you wanted to reduce, uh, you, you mocked reducing casual use, more or less, and said that we needed to reduce hardcore chronic use, but have no evidence that we've reduced hardcore chronic use. And now you're taking a program which hasn't, uh, quite frankly, I think DARE programs are very effective, often at the local level, and are best run by the local level. Uh, but much of what's happened, they go down to schools, and you're talking like some schools in my district got $72, and another one gets, uh, you know, uh, $1,500, which is not enough to really have any impact on a drug program. And we're dribbling this money away, yet we're seeing a rise in the cocaine coming in. We're having a diversion of resources, and yet the rhetoric, how do you address the fact the studies are showing it's not been effectively spent? What will the funds be used for once you take it away from the drug and say safe free schools program? Where do you intend to apply the monies? I think that you can uh, fairly state that there are uh, two parts, uh, one of which I think you will agree with, and that is, is that the um, uh, economic growth and the opportunities for people is one of the most important things, and if we don't get a control of the budget deficit. The second thing is I don't think you'll see me or others in the long term hitting the drug funding, you will see us focusing on that issue. The rescission is a separate argument from the overall argument, and that what we're trying to do is get some of the things out now so we can address the long-term plan. You took an isolated part out of an overall package to try to hit what's at our economic future towards the incentive question and took it out of the overall drug package. And I'm, I'm sorry, and I want to say I'm looking forward to working with you. I know from a personal level you're committed to this fight, and I think we have nuances of differences, uh, but I have four minutes left to get over and cast my vote, and okay. so I yield back the rest of my time. Well, I look forward to working with you. I hope you would help us when that vote co comes to the flo floor to, to take or save the drug-free schools money. I think that's where you display your commitment. Do I, something I, on behalf of the children of America. You don't display your commitment just by spending other people's money. That's part of the whole budget debate problem. You can have a commitment without the federal dollars doing that. I understand that it takes dollars to do these programs, and we'll do that. That's not the only way, however, I will show my commitment. Well, I look forward to working with you. Yeah, thank you. Gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brown, it's good to see you. I'm pleased good to see, to see you. you fellow New Yorker, and I, and I want to say to you that I think you've been doing a wonderful job under very trying circumstances. Um, and I have just come back to this committee this past year, but I served here a few years back during both the Reagan and the Bush administrations. And I was somewhat perplexed for what I've been hearing that uh, if things were so good then. It was just so wonderful. Um, a couple of things that really stood out in my mind about prior testimony that we had had of course, we know that the Contras were funded partly by drugs. I mean, that was really a, a swell time for the United States, uh, one of our high points. Uh, I also recall the, um, I think the man who was in charge of uh, customs, and I believe his name was Van Dam, and he came before the subcommittee, and he said he had the problem licked. He had put about four balloons along the southwest border. And uh, they were so good that you see somebody light a cigarette in a car down on the street. It was just absolutely the, it was it. The fact that all the drugs at that point, most of them were coming in through the Caribbean, uh, and when we asked him what about the uh, east and west coast and through Canada, they hadn't thought about that yet. And then I have another memory of a day when four or five people came in to testify with hoods over their heads so they wouldn't blow their cover. And they told us some very interesting things about how uh, we'd been so lax with people buying airplanes secondhand and converting them uh, just simply to carry cocaine into the United States and uh, then abandon the planes. And it was much easier for them to do that than to get a driver's license. But the one that really I'll never forget is that they had found a facility in West Virginia where uh, in control of people who headed up the drug traffic. And when they raided it, they found, among other things, uh, telephone numbers that went directly into the White House, into the DEA. They could intercept everything that we did. They were about 100 years ahead of us. Now, I, say, I think that, that one of the problems and the thing that I felt as a member of Congress is we did fail in interdiction. 
We've left it to the local police, really, to try to deal with this because we simply couldn't keep that junk out of the country. And um, so there's enough blame, Mr. Brown, to go around uh, along by uh, anybody's measurement. Treatment is important because I did some work in criminal justice in New York in the state legislature and in the county legislature, and I know that when a drug addict needs treatment, you can't say come back in six months. That's six more months of robbing people, doing whatever it takes to feed that habit on a daily basis. We've never had the balance that we needed. And uh, it certainly it is critically important that we do everything we can, first, to keep them out, and second, to try to dry up the demand. But anybody who says that treatment is not a major part of that, I think, is completely misreading what's been happening in the country over the years. One of the things that, uh, that I've been very concerned about are the drug courts. And uh, it seems to me that the court system uh, plays a major role. And uh, obviously, the, the, since the um, inception of drug courts, I think there's been a lot of difference uh, in freeing up some of the other courts. And in, uh, from 1986 to 91, over half of the federal prison inmates now are serving time for drug offenses. We don't do much for them while they're in prison. I think we've got an absolutely sorry record, both state and federal levels, of doing things to get people off drugs so that when they can come out uh, and finish their term, that they have a chance of, of not getting back into the drug trade. And I think that um, uh, the recidivism rate for offenders over 50 percent demonstrates again that we're not doing enough for them while they are incarcerated. But we have contrast. Offenders who successfully complete the program by the Miami Drug Court have a recidivism rate of 11 percent, down from 50. And that's pretty impressive. So I think the specialized drug courts have offered a very innovative solution. Um, you either go and the treatment and kick your habit or you go back to jail and that's it. Um, in my district we had its own drug court program and uh, I got a letter from a judge Schwartz which I'd like to include if I may for the record. I ask unanimous consent to do that. And Judge Schwartz points out it costs at least twenty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate someone and the Rochester drug program requires just a thousand to two thousand dollars per offender. And again, that's very impressive, to have something that is effective and, and cost-effective as well. In other words, the drug courts yield a much better result at about a tenth of the cost. Now, last year we sought to encourage a duplication of these successful efforts throughout the country, but unfortunately, uh, we see that these efforts are going to be gutted. The 1994 crime bill established separate grants for drug courts. They were eliminated in the crime bill that passed this year. We provided $27.7 million to help start drug uh, courts around the country last year, and that's been zeroed out. How will these reversals, Mr. Brown, damage our efforts to curb drug abuse and the violence that it causes? Uh, thank you. The Crime Control Act passed by Congress, with bipartisan support, I might add, is a key element of our national drug control strategy. The drug court very successful, promising program. Those funds will be taken away with the, with the legislation that was passed by the House that's went on now into the Senate. Uh, prevention programs, very successful. Uh, the, the funds will be taken away from prevention and given to prison construction or block grants to the city. Uh, treatment within the criminal justice system is key. To us, it makes good sense if we arrest, as we do, hundreds of thousands of people a year in this country, and the majority have substance abuse problems, makes good sense to treat them before they're released. Uh, I made the statement earlier that treatment works. That's just not my conclusion. My, one of my predecessors, Bill Bennett, who testified earlier, produced, produced a document, I'll leave for the record, where he points out that the common tendency to think of drug treatment as a soft, nurturing, and easier route away from drugs could not be further from the truth. And he goes on to point out that's why drug treatment and criminal just, justice must be understood as allies in our fight against drug use. Rand Corporation did a study that proved that the most effective intervention in addressing the drug issue would be treatment. In California, they did the most extensive study ever done that showed for an investment of $209 million in one year in treatment, the taxpayers of California, they were saved 
$1.5 billion. To me, treatment makes good sense. It's good drug policy, good crime policy, good health policy, good economic policy. Basically, it's good urban policy. Just recently, the Health and Human Services re just released this report called The Effectiveness of Substance Abuse Treatment. The, the, the bottom line being that all the research we know tells us that drug treatment works, it makes sense, it's a good investment in America. I just uh, would like to add one comment, um, and I know you have to leave here at 1.30. Um, our concern is that the heavy emphasis on treatment of hardcore users, uh, then the policy becomes just say yes, and if you get in trouble, we'll take care of you. And I don't think we want to accomplish that either. I just have one series of questions to ask relative to interdiction. Um, what is the role and responsibility of the interdiction coordinator? The President, in his effort to assist us in addressing the drug problem across the board, directed that the National Security Council do an eight-month study, well, it was a study that took eight months of our interdiction efforts. And when he released his Presidential Decis Decision Directive, P PDD number 14, he gave me the authority to appoint an interdiction coordinator. I chose to appoint the Commandant of the Coast Guard. His responsibility is to make sure that we have a clear understanding at all times about the drug threat in, in coming into the country and make sure that our resources are in the right places. It's not an operational position. Uh, the various other agencies, DOD, Coast Guard, Customs, they do the operations. But his job is to do the strategic planning to make sure that we understand the strategies used by the drug trafficking organizations, that we have our assets in the right place. Does he have the authority relative to moving detection and monitoring assets of the U.S. Customs and Department of Defense, or does he just suggest through you, or how does that work? He is not an operational person. One of the good things about what I've seen since coming into government is that there's great cooperation. Just yesterday, for example, I convened a meeting of all the relevant agencies to think through, plan, as to how we deal with the problem of drugs coming into Mexico and then into the United States. How often does the interdiction coordinator meet with the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy? We meet on a monthly basis, but we are on the phone or talk in other meetings more than that. And how often do you feel you exchange correspondences? Most of our information is exchanged on a, on a meeting basis, one-to-one, -one, in a verbal exchange. Dr. Brown, has the interdiction coordinator expressed to you either in writing or correspondence his conclusion that we need to restore assets to the interdiction force structure to return to the 1992-93 levels of effort? We've had discussions about what we should have. We have not reached, uh, my office has not reached any conclusion. What I am interested in, in determining any decision like that is what do we get for the resources we have? Uh, the, to go to any particular level without out justifying any, con any benefits from that is not the way we want to do business. We don't want to waste the taxpayer's money. At any given level, 1992, for example, uh, we were doing more in terms of buying assets. We do not need to buy those assets anymore. We have the resources. So we need to look in more detail as to what we want to accomplish, what it takes to do that, and then what resources we need to do it. But, but in his conclusion that, that he feels that we need to restore assets to the interdiction force structure, to return to the 1992-93 levels of effort. Has he formally put that in writing to you? As I mentioned to you in our private meeting, many of the correspondence we have from the interdiction coordinator are classified. And I'll be delighted to give you a classified briefing, Mr. Chairman. Okay, let me refer you to a letter dated December 1st uh, from him to you. Uh, and and says, in response to your letter of 9 November 1994, encloses a report of my findings and recommendations from the senior level interdiction conference that we co-hosted on 25 October. Now, skip down here. I reaffirm my conclusion that we need to restore assets to the interdiction force structure. This goal is to reinvigorate until such time as a viable comprehensive source country program is in place and producing the necessary results. And then we go back, it's, it is based on the agency head consensus achieved during our conference that to maintain adequate resources in theater, we must return to 1992-93 levels of effort. And then, uh, department and agencies will reapportion funding to meet the updated, if, if only in an interim direction. This working paper reflects the reasoned judgment of our staff, it is based on their involvement with these issues in the interagency. 
It represents one approximation of how reallocation may be applied. And then finally, the last enclosure contains proposed inputs for use by your staff for inclusion in a letter to the President. I believe it appropriate that we meet with the President and National Security Advisor as soon as possible to brief them on results of our conference and discuss the current state of implementation of the national strategy. Of key importance to this meeting is the determination of the priority of countering uh, narcotic trafficking as a threat to national security in the United States is evaluated against other threats to our security that compete for resources. Um, are you familiar with that letter? Mr. Chairman, the, all of the non-classified material that we have, I supplied to you three days ago. If anything that you have that's classified, this is I, not classified. Then I need to review the document in order you to refresh my memory. Copy of it. Okay. Um, I might point out if, if if you wanted to have a closed hearing, I'd be delighted to discuss any aspect of it. Okay. Or if you want a, a class, classified briefing, I'll be delighted to do that. You asked to be um, able to be to, that we wind this up at approximately 1:30, and uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts in uh, being here, working with our schedule. And uh, we, we hope that uh, all of us can submit questions uh, to you in writing, and hopefully within a week to 10 days, if we could get answers, that would be great. We'd we'll be delighted to respond. I look forward to working you on what I consider to be one of the most important issues confronting this country at this time. Mr. Chairman, I realize it's 1.30, but I came over here purposely to ask a couple of questions. I was on the floor because I'm very concerned about getting an amendment up on a product liability bill. And I came over here because I knew the time was running out, but I didn't know that there had been a pre-arrangement for 1.30, and I'd like to have the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Well, what we, Brown, what if we've he doesn't done, mind staying for about another five minutes. Well, I think it's going to be up to Dr. Brown. I think what we try to do is have a balance back and I, forth. I certainly would be delighted to accommodate you. I'll be running late on another commitment, but and, and certainly... Well, I, I, I would Mr. appreciate Chairman, it uh, Mr. if you would answer Mr. Chairman. the questions that I have. Mr. Chairman, I have additional questions also. I want right. well, to ask Mr. Brown let me, to come back. Let, let me, uh, I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the Chair. Uh, if, if Dr. Brown's willing to stay for one more question, I'll be happy to yield. I'd be more than happy. I have a three-part question then, Dr. Brown, and it's like this. A, <laughs> what congressional actions have impeded the President's initiative in the drug prevention area? B, Previous administrations have sought to interdict drugs in the, in the transit zone, and it seems that this strategy relies on the military's ability to stop boats and planes, which are already in action. And the question is, have you found transit zone interdiction to be effective? If not, have you halted this practice? And C, uh, there has been much discussion about staffing in the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the question is, uh, uh, the, the C part of the question is, what are your staffing concerns at this time? talk briefly about this fiscal year. We requested at that time a record $13.2 billion to address the drug issue and to implement the President's National Drug Control Strategy. Our overarching goal was to re reduce the number of drug users in this country <clears throat> with a special emphasis on the hardcore drug user and stop first-time drug users, our young people. We requested $355 million new dollars for our treatment program. Congress appropriated $57 million, far, far less from what we needed. We requested $191 million new dollars for our prevention programs in our schools. Congress appropriated $87 million, far, far less from what we needed. We have, an, we have a, our interdiction program where, we, where the President directed that we do a controlled shift from interdiction in the transit zone and place a greater emphasis in the source countries. Uh, Congress cut a half a billion dollars from our interdiction programs and therefore leaving us with nothing to transfer. In reference to this current fiscal year, we, ha we ha have now pending before the House a rescission package which will take 100 percent of our safe and drug-free schools monies, $482 million, which would leave nothing for the cornerstone of this nation's program to educate our children about the dangers of drug use. That will be taken away completely if that passes as proposed by the Appropriations Committee of the House. The crime bill is a big part of our national drug control strategy. In the crime bill, we have funds there for the drug court. The House has passed legislation that would abolish that. The money in the prevention programs, the House has passed legislation that would take $2.5 billion of prevention money and apply that to building more prisons and the rest of the money would be tied in with the drug courts, 
a very successful program, part of our national drug control strategy, along with the, the cops for 100,000 more police officers to implement community policing. Uh, that would be given to the states in a block grant. That's the impact we're having right now. On the transit zone, I, I, I alluded to the answer, but let me make another response to that. I am a, a police officer by career, spending over 30 years in law enforcement. And in law enforcement, when I started out and up until recently, we operated under a conventional wisdom that random preventive patrol was the best way to police our cities. But after more knowledge, we found out and subsequently determined that random patrol produces random results. And we want more for our resources than random results. That's the same thing we were doing in the transit zone, out there randomly uh, with our airplanes and boats and getting random results. We know now that intelligence-driven information is much better than random patrol in the transit zone. That's the reason that the President directed that we make the shift from the transit zone to the, to the source countries. Unfortunately, budget got ahead of policy and there was nothing to shift. Your final question deals with staffing. Uh, we have been able to increase our staff now. We have a total of 45 appropriated uh, slots that we have up from what we had previously. And we are, we will continue to get the job done. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you very much Mr. Brown, for uh, uh, answering my questions. I thank you, too, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to answer my question and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Dr. Brown, I'm just going to, we gave you a copy of that letter. I want to ask you one more time. Uh, this was written as of December 1st. Uh, it was from the U.S. Interdiction Coordinator, Admiral Kramick. It is to you. Uh, it specifically states and, and points out that his conclusion that we need to restore assets to the interdiction drug, uh, the force structure, the 92, 93 levels. Uh, did you or did you not read this letter? And if so, what is your reaction to it? I did receive this letter, and obviously there are backup material that is uh, classified. The response that I had then and the response that I have now is as we look at the expenditure of taxpayers' monies. If we make those decisions, we need to know what we're going to get from those funds. This here is an ongoing discussion that we have. Uh, the 1992 level contained funds to purchase resources, such as airplanes or boats. Those resources are already in place. So to go to an arbitrary level without taking into consideration those factors would not be the right thing to do. So you, don't, you, always, you disagree with, your, your, uh, with, with the proposal then? Well, in it's the not request. a matter of disagreeing. I think he also would point out that the people that are doing this for him are people who drive airplanes and drive ships. They're not budget people. Did you, did you make this decision yourself or did you bring it to the attention of the President? Which decision are you referring to, Mr. Chairman? His request of you. This has not gone to the President. This is a decision that I have made and it's an ongoing discussion w with, w with the Commandant, who I might add is doing an outstanding job on behalf of this country. He sure does, and there's no doubt about that. And the only request that I have of you is the one that when we talked in my office, uh, it seems to me that you're being put, you know, a very honorable person with a tremendous track record. You're in a situation where both hands are tied behind your back, and we're trying to give you the resources and the assets that you need to do the job. And we're just trying to get the facts out of what are those assets and what do you need and try to depoliticize this thing a little bit, which is kind of tough under these circumstances. But if, in fact, uh, we need to beef up interdiction efforts, we need to know what is needed. And certainly he probably is in a position to make the kind of recommendations that, that we can work with. Mr. Chairman, I will assure you that I will always support more, more resources when we can show what we get for the money. It doesn't make sense to spend the taxpayers' money without knowing it's going to make a difference. I want to show effectiveness in the allocation of resources. If you want to help, the first thing you can do is help us get back our safe and drug-free schools money that's being taken away from us. Dr. Brown, I think this is the first session of many others. There's one member here that did not get a chance to ask even a short question. If he limited it to a very quick one, would you be willing to receive it? Yes, sir. Mr. Okay. Chairman, thank you very much. But, uh, you know, quite frankly, I would like uh, to ask a series of questions, and I know Mr. Micah has I'm more. I'm prepared to but, come back any time to share okay. why, why don't we do this? If we if, can have Mr. Brown back at a subsequent if time. If he will come back, you will be the first one to lead off. I'll be delighted I, to come back, Mr. Chairman. I look forward can, to working with you. Can we you. agree on him being back 
soon. I mean, it seems to me. I would. Uh, I would also request that. Okay. And I have a series within, of questions. I'd you like obviously hit a. You've hit. You've hit a hot nerve here on both sides of the aisle. I think you've got. If you're looking for uh, volunteers to help you in this effort, you've got a lot of people you can sign up. Would you be willing to come back in the next 30 days? Well, Any time the chairman requests, I shall return, and I'll call on you for help in addressing this very well, We can't ask for anything more than that, and I, I'll let you lead off. And thank you very much, and we're very pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to let the record to be shown, though, that, that he is not the only one that has been sitting here all day waiting for questions. So has there been on the minority side? I offered it. I know. No, I, I, I know. No, I'm just... I know. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, as I understand, this hearing is not over, is it? No. no. We're just, uh, we're moving now back, Sorry, we're, we're accommodating Dr. Brown. But are we now going to return to Dr. No, Mr. Mr. Bonner and... The two Mr. members that were already yes. sworn in are going to finish up, and uh, I believe you'll be, have the first question on your side. Okay, will our witnesses return, please? We appreciate the fact that you are so willing to accommodate Dr. Brown and move aside. We appreciate that, and uh, I know your time is valuable as well. Um, we finished the testimony. We're now ready to resume questioning of the witnesses. Our good friend from West Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think, actually, I think perhaps serendipity, but I think actually the order, the way it worked out, may have been uh, worthwhile. Let me turn to Mr. Walter. Um, Mr. Walter, uh, the question I would have asked Dr. Brown is the same I'm going to ask of you. There's a chart that uh, is here from 1988 to 1992 with retail cocaine price and purity in the U.S. Uh, as I recall, uh, price dropping of cocaine on the street means that there is probably greater supply. Is that a safe assumption? Yes. I noticed that it, it seems to, according to this chart prepared by ONDCP, that the price seems to have peaked in 105, uh, and also it's a percentage of purity as well. Um, I believe it's on page, it's in your testimony as well, sir. Yeah. Um, and then starts to have dropped, begin dropping in 1990, I'm, 1992, and I believe it you're, I don't know whether it continues out in your statement or not, but the implication is that the price continues at a lower rate. That suggests that there is more cocaine available on the street. Is that correct? Yes. Well, that, I mean, I don't, I happen to think that there is enough blame that can go around on the drug war, Republican and Democrat, administration to administration. Uh, as one who chaired this uh, similar subcommittee for four years and held extensive hearings on this subject. But I don't think it's safe to, I, I think then you'd have to concede that the cocaine availability seems to be increasing prior to the Clinton administration. Is that correct? Yeah, if you let me respond, the, I, I didn't read the whole section of my testimony. The section of my testimony this refers to is the argument about treatment for hardcore users and availability and whether or not you don't have to press on availability to improve the effectiveness, especially against heavy users. My testimony explains that contrary to what is, I think, accepted in large areas, not people that have been watching this, that the interdiction doesn't make any difference and we've never been able to control supply. In fact, we had a serious disruption of supply that had important consequences, particularly for heavy users. That was during a period when the military was first deployed in large numbers at the beginning of the Bush administration and when we encouraged and supported a crackdown in Colombia. My testimony explains that the termination of the, 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 the level of military effort here was a consequence of force buildups in the Persian Gulf during, during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. After Desert Shield and Desert Storm, our efforts within the administration were to try to redeploy those assets. We never reached a decision point because the election occurred and uh, administration changed. The well, point of my testimony is that interdiction works, and I agree with you that the problem is you have to sustain the force structure and, and, and that we were not able to sustain it, but because, that was because of the Persian Gulf War and because okay. of a, a I need to, in effort in Colombia. I need to, uh, we're all talking about who, who, what's being done on whose watch, and I need to watch the clock, so I'm going to need to get my questions in. Uh, 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 on the interdiction, I'll go right to your argument. On the interdiction effort, the memo that Dr. Dr. Brown uh, distributed dated May the 1st, 1992, cocaine supply, source country and interdiction issues, executive summary on the second page, chart, um, a third of the way down, chart 24, 
uh, notes that the um, uh, supply apparently based upon modeling by DEA reaching the, this country was about the same before the Andean strategy, um, that's Operation Snowcap and, and those efforts, uh, as much as afterwards. Uh, I thought that many people concluded that the initial, in 1990 when Snowcap and other Andean efforts uh, picked up, that what happened was there was a shutdown for a period and then the traffickers shifted their direction. They didn't come overseas any, as much as they did. They started coming through Mexico. And so, uh, would you care to respond to that? The, the, my statement being that uh, interdiction has a point, but it's never achieved the result that, that uh, many had hoped. And in fact, your own goals were to have reduce uh, 50 by 50 percent the amount coming from the Andean nations. And in your own test, not your testimony, but uh, one of Mr. Bonner's representatives in a previous hearing, uh, was that that goal had never been, been closely met. Yeah, I mean, let, me, let me let Mr. Bonner re respond. But I would like just to say one thing. 15 second thing about this report. I don't remember the specific report. We did a lot of studies with a lot of people to get a broad range of ideas. But uh, this kind of alleged bombshell that we uh, uh, recognized uh, some kind of problem or failure, this doesn't say anything that doesn't, isn't said in my testimony that there was a serious disruption. What this paper does is says the disruption has not been continued because there weren't sustained pressure in the Andean region and in, and in interdiction and, and proposes a number of things to look at in order to reconstruct that. Um, uh, this is no, this is, I mean, I don't remember this specific document, but this is no bombshell to pull out of the files of the office by uh, no, sir, by, it is, uh, uh, I, current if I may interrupt, director. It is, a, it is in this regard. The statement, what I've heard in this orchestrated testimony of this previous panel, um, in the one that you're on, is the complete um, a failure, essentially, that's what you're saying, of the Clinton administration. I happen to think there's some places I disagree with it. But, but uh, the complete failure of the Clinton administration, particularly in the introduction effort. This says in 1992, long before Bill Clinton ever walked into the scene or Dr. Brown, that people were recognizing then that interdiction wasn't having that effect, that even after the Andean Initiative, you were getting as much cocaine in, the, in, this, in this country as you were before, almost as you were before. Yeah, yeah but that's but what this, this, this does not significant. say anything that isn't in my testimony. The chart you held up was prepared by me. No one's ever denied any of this. The problem is we need to return the resources on both the supply side and on the demand side to make the two sides work. The, 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 the reduction of resources in the Andean region and in interdiction was a result in case of interdiction of the Persian Gulf War and there was then an opportunity after 1992 when the war ended for the administration to take some leadership. The administration intentionally and vocally changed policy, shifting out of interdiction into hardcore treatment, it said. Um, that's a policy change and I don't think it's unfair to say the evidence shows that was not a smart thing to do. The evidence is quite clear based upon the declining uh, street price that both in the Bush administration and in the Clinton administration, cocaine is back on the street at a lower price. Heroin was, coming, was increasing coming into this country under your watch as well as the President's watch. I, what I regret about this whole hearing is I think it's valid to look at process and whether there's some steps that should be taken that aren't being. What I regret is I see a politicalization of this whole thing going on. Mm. It was okay under President Bush and we were winning the war. We're losing the war under President Clinton. That's not what, you're, what these own charts from the agency that you supervise show. That's not what the memo from the agency that you uh, look, were acting this, director of shows. Thought, look, I don't, I'm not trying to politicize this, but with all due respect, the use charts are irrefutable. We went from, uh, we, we dropped overall use by 50 percent, we dropped heavy, we dropped cocaine use by 80 percent. That is an issue of public attitudes and attention, some of which I believe is not partisan. Look, I just did a hearing over the Senate Judiciary Committee. The person hardest on Lee Brown in the administration was Senator Feinstein. Um, and uh, we've already had quotations from Congressman Rangel here. The problem is leadership on the prevention side and supporting these programs. You could, I don't think a dollar in the drug-free schools program is going to substitute for national attention and leadership. On the supply side, I am saying I am perfectly willing to admit my testimony says it. No one's trying to hide it. There was a disruption of effective effort in controlling the cocaine supply. Um, what that was caused by was a national security emergency largely, uh, but not entirely. We need to go back and do that. My testimony explains we were trying to go back and do that. The Clinton administration said, no, you don't need to worry about supply as much. You don't need to worry about prevention as much. You need to worry about hardcore treatment. What I said in my testimony, what I think my colleague said is, that's not working and we better change the policy. 
Now, it is a Democratic administration's policy, so you can say criticizing it is, is partisan, but I'm telling you it's wrong-headed, and I think that Democrats and Republicans ought to come together and tell the White House to turn it around. That's in all I'm In closing, Mr. Chairman, uh, we can talk a lot more about this, um, and perhaps I'll file some questions. In closing, I would just like to also note the re reports of this own committee on a bipartisan basis, which, as I recall, did not have dissenting views uh, to them, but I will check. There's one report I haven't checked yet, and that may have had a dissenting view. The others did not. Uh, concluded that the Andean Initiative had severe problems, made recommendations for them long before we got into the Persian Gulf War, and there were great, great uh, concerns that a lot of effort was being put in, and we weren't successfully getting the bang for the buck. Okay, thank you. Um, our Vice Chair, Mr. Ehrlich. Taking this away from politics yet again. Let's get back to the streets of America. And, I, and this is a question for both of you. And, and Judge, you uh, addressed this uh, part of my question on page 12 of your statement. And, and I read from that statement. When interdiction efforts were increased from 1989 to 1990, the price of retail cocaine jumped from 121 dollars a gram for pure cocaine to 194 dollars a gram and the estimated number of heavy cocaine users fell from uh, 2.3 million to 1.9 million now i think it's irrefutable that our policy at that time was working but let me ask you the flip side uh, do you have numbers with respect to if it occurred increase in street crime as a result of the successful interdiction efforts we were made in, in that time. You see what I'm getting at? I see what you're getting at, but actually, as you know, the, the overall level of, uh, of violent street crime, while it's totally unacceptable in our country, actually has leveled off or began to decline, uh, frankly, and, cor and, and, and I think in correlation with uh, a drop off in the, uh, the, the very high levels of uh, illegal drug use that we had uh, from the mid 1980s, as that started to decline. I, that, that, that's my point. I'd really like you to address that point because there are some, and the regional people can disagree on this, but there are some who would argue we are not paying attention to the flip side, which is price up, demand still there, result in more violent crime for those true abusers who need money to supply their habits. And, and that's what, that point I'd like you to address. The numbers do not reflect that. Is that the case? Well, uh, they certainly don't suggest that. And the fact is that you have to, to have a, a, a comprehensive strategy, you have to have some strategy that is going to be address supply or availability of, of drugs like cocaine and heroin in the United States. You simply have to have that. You have to have that even for effective treatment. I mean, if, if a, a crack or a cocaine addict is being treated and he's released back out and there's a plentiful supply and availability of cocaine, the chances of relapse are enormous. In fact, they may be greater than 90 percent from the experts I've talked to. Uh, let me also say that the strategy that was pursued on the interdiction, the broadest sense interdiction, which was really going after the highest level trafficking organizations uh, that were producing cocaine, uh, did have an effect on the wholesale price of cocaine in the United States. In other words, we saw throughout most of 1990 uh, an increase, a substantial and sharp increase in the, the price of cocaine that was being marketed on a wholesale basis in the United States. And we again saw through about half of 1992 uh, that kind of increase. So we know that we could do some things that would affect availability and supply, for example, of cocaine in the United States. What were those things? Those things were going after and attacking uh, the highest level trafficking organization and their means of transport to the United States. It was, for example, destroying, as it was destroyed with the help of DEA and, and other U.S. agencies and the Colombian government, destroying the Medellin cartel. The final, the final straw in that, of course, was the, all, the attempt to apprehend and the, uh, the death of Pablo Escobar. But the Medellin, Medellin cartel was destroyed. The Colombian government, by the way, played a big role in that, and it can do it. If it has the will to do it, it can do it. The other thing we saw, responding a bit to Mr. Weiss, is we saw effective interdiction efforts uh, in Mexico. It's true that most of the cocaine that was coming into the United States was coming through Mexico, not as of 1990. It goes back to about 1985. But in 1990, the government of Mexico, uh, working with the U.S. government, set up an interdiction program that used, to a certain extent, I can't go into a, a great detail, but it used some intelligence developed uh, by the U.S. military but ultimately the Mexican government was responding to drug trafficker flights from the Colombian, directly out of Colombia, that were landing 
in Mexico. And the first of these, by the way, was very poignant. The first one they responded to was in the fall of, of 1990, when the Colombian traffickers had sent up seven King Air aircraft, each with about 700 kilos of cocaine in, in them. And the, the first effective response of what was called the Northern Border Response Force was to capture five of those seven air, Colombian aircraft on the ground while they were being refueled, seized five tons of cocaine at the site, arrested five Colombian pilots. Uh, and it was that kind of activity coupled with activity directed against the leadership key lieutenants and the money laundering, the cash flow of, the, of these cartels that caused uh, a decrease in the availability of, of cocaine in the U.S. We can do it. We need to get back to doing it. Yeah, and I think there was one misapprehension I, 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 that uh, Mr. Brown left with people. Um, initial experimentation might have been this way, but not since very early times in drug interdiction, certainly in my experience in the Bush administration. Uh, does anybody fly around randomly looking for drugs? There is an uh, effort to cue intelligence and to use uh, analysis. Nobody bores holes in the sky or in the water with aircraft and ships in order to kind of randomly go look for drugs. It's not the way it's done, hasn't been done that way, shouldn't be done that way. And uh, I, I, I regret that he said that. On the issue of crime, the data suggests the biggest single contributor in terms of drugs and crime is people on drugs who are violent. It's not that they carry out violence to carry out the drug trade, it's that it causes them to abuse children, abuse their spouses, be violent with other people, uh, be disinhibited and paranoid and more prone to violence. When you reduce the consumption of drugs, you reduce that violence. The single biggest source of the expenditures, the one study that the, oh, at Mr. Brown's office did on heroin addicts in three cities, New York, Chicago, and San Diego, says a big part of the drug problem, at least at this case, is being paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. Because the single biggest source, I repeat, from his study is public assistance is the major and perhaps the single largest source of income for heroin users. So um, the, the taxpayer, in other words, with the best of intentions of trying to support the poor because of the focus of this problem, because we haven't been able to shrink it in the poorest neighborhoods, is nonetheless having the, the help we're trying to give the poor sucked into the pockets of drug lords. And uh, in my argument on, on, on the issue of kind of controlling supply and controlling that trade is simply echo Mr. Bennett's. If this was going on with white kids in the suburbs, we would fly aircraft, we would deploy the military, we would decertify and put a trade embargo on Colombia, and we'd allow the U.S. to pass information even if those nations were going to shoot down aircraft. We don't do that because we don't give attention to, these, to the very people who are the, unable to protect themselves in this country and are being made victims of this thing. And uh, that's the policy distinction. It's not a political game. It's about what do you want to do with the poor kids in this country. And if you don't stop this poison from them, they're the ones that are going to be dug, a, dug in a hole. Thank you both very much. Okay, Mrs. Slaughter. I, I certainly agree with you about the crime rate and, uh, and, and drug use, but I, I still have to say that I don't think we had a golden age of interdiction here. Uh, again, I remember at least one time when the Commandant of the East Coast Guard came before our subcommittee and he had been given um, several uh, boats in the budget but no gas to get them and they had never left the dock. Um, it never did, it, and that really, frankly, always struck me as uh, uh, very uncoordinated and a haphazard kind of thing. I know we knew Noriega was dealing there for years and you know, we tolerated that, but at any rate, um, I, I just a question to Mr. Walters that your testimony before the Judiciary uh, Committee in the Senate that uh, said that the presence of law enforcement and open-air drug markets breaks the connection between the supplier and the buyer just by standing there. Isn't that a good reason why we should have kept the 100,000 cops on the street? I think we should have more police on the street. I think it's, a, it's the same thing. It's a national disgrace that in inner-city neighborhoods it is accepted as a fact of life that we are going to allow open-air drug markets to exist without harassment. But, I will say, I also believe that is fundamentally a local responsibility. I do believe that uh, if you want to provide one-shot help in some regard, that's fine. But the federal government should not become a national police force. It will not police the streets of communities better than local police. And the one thing you have to do to make any of these resources work, whether it's prevention or police officers, is hold officials accountable. More than paying another federal program, we ought to empower citizens to go to their mayors and their city councils and say, 
You either close down the open air drug markets or we fire you and hire somebody else who will. Well, I, you know, I don't, there was never any intention of us putting federal police on the streets. And I absolutely agree with you. The only thing in the world that will stop this is community policing, where the people who live in a neighborhood work together with the policeman that they know who's there all the time, not a couple of guys riding around in a squad car. And, and I think that basically, and to some degree, was what Mr. Brown was saying, was that when you ride around in a squad car, you randomly run upon a crime. But it's a whole lot different. And if you're there on the street all the time and everybody knows you and the kids have some idea that you're there to try to help them. But it, I, I'm not trying to make any case that this is federal responsibility. To me, the federal responsibility was interdiction. It's the yes, federal responsibility to protect the borders. I think we failed woefully in that. I think everybody has. And what's happened, in my view, is we've left it to the local policemen on the street and the mayor to try to deal with it because we failed. We can't seem to keep the stuff from coming in here. I would say it's a joint responsibility here, but I certainly agree with you. I think my testimony and those of my colleagues suggest the federal government has failed to control supply to the degree to which it can. I never said there was a golden age. It was a tough struggle. But, Mr. But Wise was at hearings where now. we fought the tough struggle. But the question uh, in, in, in for me, are you not saying that it is worse now than it was? Yes, I am. There's just simply no, nothing to well, back the, that the, up. The, the, the emergency room admissions for cocaine, heroin, and marijuana are at record level. I, I'll tell you what backs it up. Mr. Brown introduced in December his ONDCP pulse check of the drug problem. I quote the, seg the relevant segments in my testimony. It's the administration's drug office assessment that supply is up, use is up, addiction is up, and, and purity is up. But then it's what not you, me. Are you contradicting what you said to Mr. Wise then, that the fact that the price is down indicates that there's a large supply, which means that we have done nothing about cutting it? Yeah, when when, 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 when things are cheaper, before, it generally indicates there is more supply than there is demand. I agree. But not now. No, the, the, we're, at, we're, at, we're at low prices and high purity. And this, Heroin, this, cocaine, did, this and didn't start with Mr. Brown. It did not start, the drug problem did not start with Mr. Brown. I never said that. Or more oh, president. No, and, and no, please don't indicate, and, I don't and, want you and, to have and, any and, idea and, I'm trying to say that either. What I'm saying to you is that what I've heard this morning when I was here earlier was that things were really going great, really doing fine. It was just wonderful. And then all of a sudden, we just sort of fell apart. And I have to tell you that the, the years that I spent on this committee and the subcommittees, I said, I never heard anything like that. Well, look, look, As a look, matter of fact, all we heard one day after day was abject failure. No, I agree with you. And look, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but you know, just reading accounts here and there, it looks to me as though the present uh, person who's in charge of, uh, of uh, customs, as well as the woman prior to that, have done more in drug interdiction, at least uh, they're doing a better job than, than I recall. Yeah, but it, it, it's a matter of proportion here. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I respect what you're saying, but I disagree. It's a matter of proportion. Drug use was going down and it dropped dramatically. In the last two years, for high school seniors, it's increased more rapidly than the entire sustained decline, decline of the previous four years. And we are on a trajectory to have the largest increase of casual, and heavy drug use in the country's history if we don't change that trajectory. Secondly, it wasn't perfect. There were all kinds of problems. I admit that in my testimony. I said we need to turn it around. But the current policies are going to make it worse. And thirdly, I would say that, um, um, look, the real problem is both leadership in, 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 on the prevention side and is targeting and managing these, these programs. You know how hard it is to manage a federal government. The current administration, my position, supply deputy, the coordinator for all the supply reduction programs and working with agencies like DEA, the administration haven't, hasn't even nominated a person to fill that job after cutting the staff by 80 percent. Now, how is he supposed to be doing his job? No wonder he can't remember the things that come in the mail. He's trying to do it alone. As Mr. Bennett said, I feel some sympathy for him. But it doesn't change the fact that you want the programs to run effectively, you want the management and coordination, but you cut the arms off the people who are supposed to do it. If you don't want Mr. Brown to do it, if the president doesn't, appoint somebody else. But you've got to do the job. Okay. Um, Mr. Shattuck from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by focusing a little bit on uh, some of Mr. Brown's own testimony. I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 9-year-old son, and quite frankly, uh, what has been said here today on both sides, and uh, I commend the gentlelady for her acknowledgement that there has been a failure 
uh, I think, of drug policy at the federal level uh, in the last at least two years. Um, but Mr. Brown, uh, in his testimony, sh says we have shifted the focus away from the easy part of the drug problem, reducing casual use, to the most difficult aspect, reducing chronic hardcore drug use. Um, I, I guess I'd like to first ask if you think the easy part of the drug problem is reducing casual use, and, and if in fact you think there is any real benefit to trying to reduce uh, the chronic hardcore use. Because I don't see any benefit to the policies we pursued for my 13-year-old or my 9-year-old. Well, I, let me say a couple of things about that. The, the problem with, as I see it, with uh, Dr. Brown's uh, approach, and I have great respect for Dr. Brown, by the way, is that if you emphasize, as he is, the, the hardcore drug use and treatment of hardcore drug users, you're, you're, you're assuming that the drug problem is a, stra a static one, that we have a certain number of hardcore drug users here, and then we have a certain number of casual drug users, and we just take care of these hardcore drug users, the problem goes away. Well, of course, that's wrong. The drug problem is a dynamic one, and that is to say, as you increase the number of casual users, you are down the pipeline going to be increasing the number of hardcore users that have to deal with. And so when you have a strategy as the current administration strategy is, that is so, so focused in terms of its emphasis on treatment of hardcore addicts, it's basically like uh, um, bailing water out of a leaky boat that's sinking and not doing anything about the leaks in the new, new water that's entering that's going to sink, is going to sink the boat. And so uh, it just isn't a strategy that's going to work. The second problem with it I've, I've always had, and that is we all want to believe that there is drug treatment. I mean that there is drug treatment out there and you can take these hardcore drug users uh, that are uh, addicted to cocaine, crack, methamphetamine and the like and that you can uh, get them into treatment and get rid of the problem. First of all, most of these people do not want treatment. Let's understand that. They do not want treatment. But when you do get them into treatment, do you get them into treatment programs these treatment programs do not have a very good success rate. They're pretty expensive, but they don't have a good success rate. I quoted earlier, but I think it is remarkable that with respect to crack addicts, uh, that uh, after, uh, after treatment programs, uh, less than 10% are free of drugs, free of crack after 24 weeks. So you, you don't want to put too many eggs in that basket. Don't get me wrong, we ought to have drug treatment. It ought to be properly funded. We ought to be trying to identify those drug treatment programs that work and work best for different kinds of uh, situations. But we also have to do something about getting a prevention message, an education message out to our young kids that we're not doing. And we also have to not give up, as I think this administration has, on the objective of serious drug enforcement going after the upper echelons, the top echelons, the kingpin organizations, not to give up on that because we are giving up on it. We're not going to the Colombian president, Mr. Samper, and this has to be President Clinton himself and saying, this is unacceptable that your country is pumping out and pouring out hundreds of metric tons of cocaine to the United States and now heroin. It's unacceptable. Let me take one, one quick parable. And by the way, I agree with everybody here. Let's not make this a partisan issue. Uh, but I want to give one parable of presidential leadership and what it can do. And that was back in the early 1970s when there was a very serious heroin smuggling problem into the United States and that heroin was being produced in France. Uh, then President Nixon met with Pompidou, President Pompidou of France. And it was an off agenda item, but he turned to Pompidou and in substance from the counts I've read, said, this is unacceptable that you're shipping heroin into our country and poisoning our, our citizens in America. And Pompidou, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure he even knew that this was a problem, but within about a year or two years, the French had gone down to Marseille, they had sent special police forces down there, and had incarcerated virtually every major heroin trafficker in France. And that was the end of heroin for all practical purposes coming out of France and frankly for about 15, 10 to 15 years it decreased for a very long period of time the flow of heroin in this country. Now that's reversed but it is an example of what we have to do if we're serious in our foreign policy that, that, that drugs, drug control is a serious high level foreign policy objective of this country. If it is then we have to mean it and we have to tell other countries like Colombia that we mean it. 
I guess the last question I ask quickly is, in the last testimony they were questioning, there was some reference to the fact that as though this problem had gotten dramatically worse. In point of fact, with the lack of leadership at the national level on, on prevention of this issue and the retrenchment in interdiction, the charts that we have before us show that there has been a dramatic increase since 1992. Yes, sir. Yes, definitely. And, and that's as a, you would agree that's as a result of policies this government has chosen to pursue? I've outlined, yeah, my, my initial statement, the three things. Absence of, particularly absence of presidential leadership and uh, the, the failure to maintain and continue a focus, uh, not to give up and say it's hopeless, but maintain a focus on reducing availability by pursuing a strategy, a kingpin strategy, or call it what you like, against the highest level trafficking organizations that, if destroyed, can reduce the amount of cocaine and heroin coming into this country. And by the way, I disagree with Dr. Brown. They may say that as part of the strategy, they're still pursuing the kingpin strategy, but I know with DEA, they're no longer pursuing the kingpin strategy in any serious way. They've shifted resources away from that. And uh, I don't think, uh, despite the rhetoric, that we were actually uh, making any serious attempt on the international level uh, to do what we can do, I believe, about the problem. Thank you. Mrs. Thurman. Mr. Walters, um, not only by your testimony, but also you've written some articles more recently for the Washington Times. And I, um, there was one thing that you talked about in uh, complaining about the real prospect of foreign nations permitting the unchallenged production and shipment of illegal drugs to the U.S. and throughout the world. What do you suggest we do? Um, and I note that you want the Pentagon in charge of stopping the influx of drugs. What I'd like to know is, have you asked the military if it wants to do that, number one? And number two, um, especially after some of the debates we've had more recently, have we asked your Republican colleagues who complain that the military is engaging in too many non-traditionally mil military activities and what their opinion is on this? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, construe, your, I'll construe your ask the military as when I was in government. I don't ask very many government agencies to do much anymore. So when you were in? Yeah. Um, look, one of, the, one of the things that I think uh, uh, people in the military deserve credit for was at the beginning of the, of the Bush administration, and, and Mr. Bennett led this, uh, we made it in the, when, at the end of the, uh, uh, the Reagan administration um, to get the military involved in detection and monitoring. That's not just flying boats and planes to, to stop aircraft, but it is a whole intelligence collection. As Mr. Bennett liked to say, the military has big eyes, big ears, and some big brains that can help a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, to his credit, I think uh, Secretary Cheney and, and, and uh, then Chief of Staff Powell agreed and for the first time deployed the military on a wide, on a wide uh, array of activities, including supporting uh, law enforcement agencies and an interdiction. Um, uh, there are some obvious problems with this mission from the point of view of the military, and I'm not trying to hide that, and Mr. Bennett alluded to it. Look. One, the military doesn't like to be engaged in wars. They're not sure the, the civilian leadership of the United States is committed to. Now, that was not such a problem, quite honestly, in my view, and I don't mean to be partisan, in the previous administration, because it began with the inauguration speech of staking your uh, uh, presidency on this issue as one of the important issues. So it's not surprising that currently they have backed off. Secondly, the military is now stretched for resources. If they don't have the resources to do the variety of jobs, there's going to be a problem in them making a commitment. That's understandable. But there, thirdly, yes, there are some questions about whether or not this is a, a, a mainstream mission. Those should be solved, but I will point out that that's what policymakers are for, and the question you have to assess is, can they make some contribution? I've tried to provide you the evidence as, as to why we thought they could and did make a contribution and why the moving of them out of that is a problem. Governor, the drug war, my understanding, has always had an overseas dimension. Um, from Richard Nixon's program to eliminate opium production in Turkey to George Bush's Avian Initiative, Washington has always looked beyond its borders to combat the drug trade. Isn't the current transit zone interdiction strategy, strategy, which focuses on helping countries where drugs are produced or which provide supply routes, merely a continuation of that strategy? Uh, I must have missed something. And would it be a continuation of that strategy uh, mm -hmm. if we continue to emphasize that? Yeah, I would say that's right. You know, first of all, I have some disagreements with the the approach toward quote interdiction uh, that's occurred that go back a number of years that go back to the Bush administration. Mr. Walters is aware of them, and it, it is this: that you can't 
purely by interdiction, if we mean by that, the, in a very limited sense, just seizing dope or seizing drugs, we cannot uh, do something that is going to have any significant effect on availability. We have to have a broader strategy. And within that broader strategy, which, uh, which I of course, refer to as the kingpin strategy and have referred to it in my testimony, there the military can support that strategy. In other words, it does have certain capabilities in terms of detection and monitoring that can be supportive. What I'm concerned about and was concerned about uh, as, when I was head of DEA was how, to you, how do you harness the Department of Defense so that it is actually supporting what is a, in essence, a civilian law enforcement agency, DEA, with vast operations overseas. As you know, DEA is in 55 countries, every major drug producing and transshipment country in the world. How do you get it supporting the civilian agency? Very, very difficult it, it, to do, by the way. I found that very difficult because very frequently the tail would end up wagging the dog. Okay. And we would end up with a lot of money spent just interdicting drugs, but not with the objective of destroying the, the upper level echelons and the organizations that financed and produced and distributed them. That we have to do for, if we're going to have a serious and profound impact on availability. But we were able to do that to some degree. And I pointed out both in 1990 and 1992 that we did affect the wholesale price of cocaine in the, in the United States, which indicates to me the only inference is that there was less cocaine uh, that was reaching the United States, and that's because of disruption of the ability to produce and supply. So. Uh, I don't know if that totally answers your question. I think we're sort of maybe muddling along in the same way, but what we really need is somebody accountable, somebody in charge of this enforcement side who can come before Congress and who can tell the President what we're doing, how we're going to do it, and then report whether we're, you know, what our successes are. And that we don't have. And I, and I believe that throughout this testimony today and probably what we'll be looking at over the, we all have ideas as to how this could be stopped, of none of which have always been proven to be the best. So, I, I mean, I think we all have to recognize this. This is not an easy question. It certainly sure. is not. It may be solvable, but it's going to take some time, and I think we all need to recognize all the efforts that have been put in both by past administrations and certainly not tearing down those that have been on, but learn from what you did so that we can move in to make this a more productive uh, and effective program. I couldn't agree more. Well, we thank you all. As you know, we have a, a vote in the House, and what I will do is to call a 10-minute recess so that we can all go vote and to give the uh, next panel time to get situated. So we'll see you all in 10 minutes. Well, it's been a while.